going to see in the first part quantifier elimination. So let me recall you once more what, what, what this is about, right? So definition, um, an L theory, T has quantifier elimination or eliminates quantifiers, has quantifier. If for every L formula, by X with, let's say X, a multivariable X1 up to Xn, there is another formula, but this time quantifier free, so without quantifiers, there is an, there is a quantifier free L formula psi of x such that these two formulas are equivalent modulo the theory such that T implies for every x phi of x holds even evenly psi of x holds okay so this is having quantifier elimination and, and one of the I mean, one of the applications that this is going to have, we have two, two applications. Basically, if you have a theory that eliminates quantifier or has quantifier elimination, this means that you have a nice way to um, describe the definable sets of models of T, right? Because then you only need to restrict to formulas that don't have quantifiers and those formulas are usually, I mean, not in every language, but usually easy to describe, right? You don't have quantifiers, you only have Boolean combinations of atomic formulas, right? By Boolean combinations, I mean just using conjunction and negation, right? So usually, usually if you have a theory that eliminates quantifiers, this is not always the case, but if you have a uh, kind of a natural theory that eliminates quantifiers, then you have some sort of way to describe in an easy way the definable sets of its models, right? So this is a desirable, desirable <laughs> property if one wants to uh, understand which are the definable sets of the models of a given theory, right? On the other hand, it also uh, serves as a method to prove that theories are complete. Because if you manage to prove uh, that a given theory T has quantifier elimination, then this also happens, I mean, this also holds in particular when this one is a sentence, right? So if this is a sentence, this is saying that every sentence of the language has to be equivalent to a quantifier free sentence, right? In particular. And usually quantifier free sentences perhaps, well, are not too difficult to describe, right? And then if you show, let me write this, this as an observation observation. Suppose T has quantifier elimination and any two models of T of T satisfy exactly the same quantifier free sentences satisfy the same quantifier free sentences. Then T has to be complete. Let me explain why. This is not too difficult, right? To show that T is complete, we only need to show that any two models of T are elementarily equivalent, right? This is what we what we proved earlier in this week. Being complete is the same as any two models are elementarily equivalent. If any two models satisfy the same quantifier-free sentences, but every sentence is equivalent to a quantifier-free sentence, then 
every two models need to satisfy exactly the same sentences, no matter if they have quantifiers or not, because you give me a quantifier, uh, uh, a sentence with quantifiers, it is equivalent to a quantifier free, but then these two models satisfy the same quantifier free sentences, then any two models have to be elementarily equivalent, right? So using this, this is another way in which one can show a given theory is complete. Proving quantifier elimination and then trying to see if any two models satisfy exactly the same quantifier free sentences. Yes? There are not so many because quantifier free sentences are this atomic. Atomic, and yes. They have one, and they have half, yeah, atomic. atomic, right? And negation. negation and conjunctions of atomic formulas. That's it. But depending on the language, this can be big or not big, right? This really depends on the language. If the language, for example, has no constant symbols, then this is very easy. This is only top and bottom, and we're done. Because out of if we don't have a constant function, uh, constant symbols, we cannot have any atomic formula without quantifiers, right? The formulas, the atomic formulas are just top of the form R and some terms, right? T1 up to Tn, or the equality between two terms, right? But if you have no constants, these terms, we, we said a term is either a variable, a constant, or a, something that has been built with constants and, uh, and variables, right? Out of functions of the language. But if I have no constants, then this is going to have at least one variable, but this is not going to be a sentence because we don't have quantifiers, right? Exactly, the constants are, well, if you have at least one constant, then you also need to take into account all the function symbols because if you have one constant and a lot of function symbols, then you need to be careful about. Is it possible to say right away the theory that models semi-algebra exists? Um, absolutely. This, this is, so, this, this is. This is this is the theory of real closed fields, right? Let's have one example in mind. Well, let, let, let me first, before going into this example, let me um, let, let me give you other examples in which, well, let me give you actually a criterion to prove quantifier elimination, and then I'll I'll give you I'll give you this example of real closed fields, okay, where the definable sets are going to be exactly the semi-algebraic sets, okay. We'll, we'll come to that in a second, but let me then do some easier cases first, and then we'll arrive to, to this one. So in general, it is not easy to show that a given theory has quantifier elimination. I'll give you a criterion, which I'm not going to prove. The proof is in the notes. The proof is a little bit long. It uses the compactness theorem. Is it, it is not difficult, but a little bit cumbersome to, to show here. But what we're, what we're going to do is to apply this criterion and try to show uh, a little bit more theories that have quantifier elimination. Okay, so let me give you this criteria. So this is a criterion, first criterion, let's say criterion one for quantifier elimination. So the following are equivalent. The first one is T has quantifier elimination. And the second one is the following. For any two models, M and N models of T, having a common substructure, having a common substructure, Let's say A, right? A is a common substructure of both M and N. <clears throat> if we have um, Phi of X, Y, with X, let's say, is uh, a tuple, X1, Xn, and Y is just one, one variable, right? And Y is just one, one variable. And we suppose this formula is quantifier free so if this is a formula so is a quantifier free l formula 
it holds the the following thing. If m, ah, sorry. So if we have a quantifier-free formula and some tuple a in a to the n, this implication holds. If m satisfies that there exists some y phi of a y, then the same has to hold in n. OK. So what we're saying is to have quantifier elimination is the same as solving the following problem for any pair of structures and any given substructure. So let, let me do perhaps a, a, a kind of, a, let's let suppose this is M, this is N, and here I have this common bit, which is A. It's a common substructure, right? If I have a quantifier-free formula, which is true for A and some element in M, right? I have a witness here, some B for the formula phi of A, B, right? This is a formula that depends on some parameters of A, but it has a witness, right, in M. Then I can always produce something similar in N. I'm going to produce some B prime here such that N also satisfies this formula, but now with respect to some B prime. And if I can... Every superstructure, this doesn't need to be a model. This, this substructure does not need to be a model, but these two have to be models of the theory. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Which makes our life a bit more complicated because we have to check for more. That, that, that's, that's correct. That's correct. This, this, the fact that this is not a model, it's important, right? It's, it's, but we know, for example, that atomic formulas go up and down, right? So for atomic formulas, this is not a problem, right? Because we saw an atomic formula holds in the substructure if it holds upstairs, so we can move from one to one for atomic formulas. The problem is really existential because if something, I mean, something does not need to, to if, if I have a solution in M, for sure, the solution does not need to be in A. So I cannot do, there is someone, someone in A and move it to B. There is something extra that needs to be acknowledged, right? For example, I could have, I could have something like this. I could have uh, here uh, the complex numbers, and here I could have just the algebraic closure of Q, right? And they both have Q as a substructure, right? Here I have solutions for a lot of polynomials over Q, right? It is not because I take one solution here over Q that I can just go down, find the solution here, and then go up. Because, for example, here, uh, square root of, uh, doesn't matter, square, square root of two, right, is here, but I have no solution of the polynomial for square root here. So something extra needs to be done if I want to show that here there is also a square root of two. Okay, in this case, it's easy because I know this is algebraically close, right? But the, 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 the idea of the proof is not just finding solutions in A and then going up to B. We need to really use the fact that these two are models of T. I mean, this is a really a property of the, of the theory T and not just of the fact that I can move uh, atomic formulas down and, and up. So I, I need to really use, in this case, I, I really need to use the fact that these two are algebraically closed in order to uh, find a solution for this polynomial or for the polynomial uh, x minus two uh, equals zero. I mean, this is the formula that I'm, I, I mean, if you, if you want, this is the formula I am looking, it has a solution here, right? We know that square root of two satisfies this this formula, and this has a parameter if you want from Q. But I, I need to also find something that satisfies the same formula here. And well, I need to use the fact that this one is algebraically closed in order to do so. Yes? So I mean, you, you can um, move up and like any quantifier, not just atomic forms, but any quantifier-free formula can go up and down. Like Absol within that ab absolutely, okay. absolutely. 
any quantifier formula is going to to move up and down. This is because we 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 proved it, right? We showed the formulas which are preserved by an embedding are precisely the quantifier free ones, right? So if you have a quantifier free formula, this goes up and down, right? But it goes up and down when you when you only realize it with elements in A, right? I cannot when I have this element V, this formula I cannot go down because the B is not in A. It doesn't make any sense to to ask if A satisfies this formula because B is not an element in A, right? I I I cannot do this, right? So this makes no sense. If all my parameters were just parameters in A and my formula is quantifier free, this I can do. I can move it up and down. But the problem is that this B I don't know if it is in A or not. In particular, this one is definitely not in Q. So I cannot really move this formula up and down, right? The, 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 the sentence just saying square root square minus two is zero. This I cannot uh, make it go down into Q because this element is not an element in Q, right? Nevertheless, I'm going to find some B prime here, actually the square root of two, right? Which also satisfies the same formula. Right. Okay, so this is this is one way in which one can prove elimination of quantifiers. Actually, let, let's do this exercise. Let's show that actually algebraically closed fields, the theory of algebraically closed fields eliminates quantifiers. So we need to solve this all this this sort of problem, but now for any quantifier free formula here. Okay. So theorem, uh, I'll write it this way. The, the every theory, just ACF. I have no, I didn't put the part of the characteristic. So just the axiom saying that I am a field together with this sentence, sentences saying that every degree of polynomial D, monic polynomial of degree D has a solution. I'm not going to specify the characteristic, okay? So I don't add neither the negation of one plus one equals to zero and so on for every prime, nor that uh, one plus one plus one, let's say is zero. So I'm not specifying the characteristic. This is a subset of each of these other theories that we saw, ACFP for P either a prime or zero. So this theory eliminates Quantifiers. Okay, let's prove it. So we're going to use this criteria, right? We use. Can I do it? Can you skip the point two divided one? What happens from there? A nice. Ah, that one implies two. This is easy. Yes, four. Right. Two implies one is. Absolutely. Two in place one is difficult. I mean, it's not fully difficult, but it's absolutely not trivial. <clears throat> so, okay. To, to show that two in place one, we really need to work a bit and use compactness in a non trivial way. So, um, because I wanted to save some time to, to, to give you more things about valued fields and prepare you for next week, I think I'm going to skip the, the, the proof. It's in the notes if you want to. Have it a look, but it takes almost one page of taking the right theory from which one is going to use compactness to, to derive this. It's not obvious at all how to move from two to one. I agree. This has to be, yeah, there, there is some, some clever idea to, to, to use. Yes. If you want, if we, we can, we can, we can discuss it later. Uh, in, in, in this uh, informal session after after the course, right? <laughs> okay, so we use we use the criterion from the criteria. Okay, so let so take k and f two algebraically closed fields. 
right? And A be a given substructure of these two fields, right? Note first an observation is that A, if A is a substructure, it needs to contain already either FP, the, fri the prime field, or Z. Because if A is a substructure, it has to be closed. It has to contain one, right? Because our language contains the element one. And it has to be closed under plus and minus. So you need to contain, if your field is of characteristic zero, A has to contain Z. And if your field is of characteristic P, it has to contain FP, right? Let me write this. Observe that since the language of rings contains uh, a constant for one and plus and minus, right? A either contains the integers if, let's say, K or F are of characteristic zero, or the prime field FP is contained in A if K and F have characteristic P, right? And this implies in particular that actually both K and F need to have the same characteristic, right? Because they have a common substructure which is which contains either the integers or or FP. In particular, they have the same characteristic. Characteristic of K is the same as the characteristic of, of F. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's take one of these one of these formulas, right? Mm. Okay, here is there is a little bit of, of, of kind of logical manipulation, but I'll 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 say it. So now let this phi of x y be a quantifier free formula. L ring formula. Now, I'm going to use something about quantifier free formulas. This is um, not too difficult. We're going to use some little theorem about, uh, this is kind of about propositional logic, is that any quantifier free formula is always equivalent to one which is a disjunction of conjunctions of atomic or negated atomic formulas. Let, let me write it here, but this is not difficult. This is like applying the Morgan rules and rules of propositional logic just to get exactly this form, right? Kind of uh, the distributivity of this junction over conjunction and so on in order to get just um, all these junctions first and then bunches of conjunctions. Okay, I'll, I'll write it. So by standard, let me say standard equivalences uh, between, let me say just propositional logic in propositional logic, right? Uh, phi of x, y is equivalent, or this is the same as we may assume that phi of x, y uh, is equivalent to a quantifier free formula of the following form, L ring formula of the following form, of the form, first I take a disjunction, finite disjunction, right? Let me put here perhaps just an I of a conjunction. Let me put here, here put a, a J. And here, let me put theta of, ij of x, y, and each theta ij is going to be atomic or negated atomic. Can I 
delete the criterion. We are already recall what we need to show. I'm going to assume that this formula holds for some elements in my substructure and some element in K, and I need to find a solution now in F. I'll, I'll write it again here. But let me finish to write this sentence because I haven't finished. So. This is where each theta i j x y is atomic or negated atomic. Okay. This is not difficult. Do you want me to, to, to give you a, an idea? I think it, it, it's really not too difficult to see that if you have a quantifier, recall, quantifier free formulas are obtained only by atomic and then you use negations and conjunctions, right? But then, well, I want it in a form which is at the end only conjunctions of negations instead of, let's say you, you could have, for example, that this formula is the negation of a big conjunction, right? Then you use, the Morgan's rule to know that this is just the conjunction of the negation of the disjunction, sorry, of the negation of each one, right? And you're using this loss a lot to get really something of this form. Now you use the following. Now note, know that this formula, this is actually true in, in, in any model, it, it doesn't matter. The formula there exists the y and this disjunction this thing is equivalent to i can the disjunction i can put it apart this is the same as either there exists uh oh sorry this is right there exists a y such that directly i put here the conjunction of the Theta i j x y. Okay, so basically this is saying suppose there exists a y such that one of these formula holds. This is the same as saying at least one of these formula holds. And this, you, you want to say t implies the t. This is this is true even with t or without t. This is going to be true in every model. I can put t, but it doesn't matter. This is actually true everywhere. It's even stronger, right? This is true always. This is just like a. That's what that means. Like it's not true for everything. With nothing, it only. It, this means for every. Let me put it like this for the empty theory, right? <laughs> the empty theory already shows this because every this. Every L ring structure satisfies this, right? Because this is just like a logical co uh, equivalence. If you can, you can pull out the existential quantifier out of a disjunction, okay? This is just true. So we are reduced, if, if we want to show this, right? We want, to, we want to show that this formula, if it's going to be true at a given, well, let, let me write. Then uh, let A be some element in my substructure, right? such that my field K satisfies the formula there exists, Y such that phi of a Y, right? Our task is to prove that F satisfies the same formula, right? This is the, the, the task of the criterion. Let, let me write it. Uh, we finish the proof. If we manage to the proof, if we find some B prime right in F such that F satisfies this formula here. This is our task, right? This is what we need to show the criterion, right? The criterion establishes that in order to prove quantifier elimination, I need to suppose 
that one of the models satisfies this existential formula. And then I need to show that the other one satisfies it, but this is the same as finding a B, which satisfies this formula, right? Now, by these equivalences here, this is now equivalent or sufficient to find one which satisfies one of these formulas here, right? So by the equivalences, the equivalences above, it suffices to show that if M satisfies now the formula, there exists a Y conjunction of J's for, let's say for one of these I's fixed, right? Let me write it to show, let me write it like this, it's better, for I zero fixed that M satisfies there exists Y conjunction over J of um, theta I zero J of X, Y implies N satisfies this implication. Sorry, satisfies this existential quantifier. With ACE. Sorry? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if K satisfies this one, then F satisfies this one. Is it is it clear why? Let, let me try to unravel what I just said. If we show, let me call this a star, right? If I manage to show star, then I want to prove that this implication is true, but this implication holds if and only if one of them holds, then I suppose that one of them holds, then I need I have this implication and then I prove the same for F, right? Is it more or less clear? Okay, yes? Why do K and F have the same characteristic? Yes, this is because they have a, a common substructure, right? And if they have a common substructure, either they have both Z, but in this case, they must have both characteristic zero, or either they have the finite field FP. And in this case, they have they need to have both characteristic P. Because recall, for example, that um, these formulas, these two formulas, I don't want to write them for the moment here, but sorry for the people recording. Or I'll, I'll write them for a second here and, and I'll uh, say out loud what I'm saying is that this formula, the formula one plus one plus one, P times equal to zero. This is a, a quantifier free formula. So it goes up from A to K and it goes also up from A to F. So if this formula is true in A, which is the case when FP is a subset of A, then this formula is going both up to K and F, but this means that K and F need to have characteristic P, yes? And if the negation of all these formulas are true, they also go up, and this is the case where Z is a subset of A, and in this case, both K and F need to have characteristic zero, right? In this case, it's not more than a subring, but um, <clears throat> in particular, you contain in this case, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, the, the actual field of P, right? Okay, you're right. Okay, so this, the only thing that I have done so far is to reduce our problem to an existence, to a little, I mean, to, to I, I just decrease the complexity of my formula so far. I only said, okay, I need to show this um, um, implication for a formula, which is, exist it has one existential quantifier, but, but here I only have a conjunction, finite conjunction, of these atomic or negated atomic formulas. Now, let us look how are these atomic or negated atomic formulas in the language of rings to see 
what is the form of, of the thetas, okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, the atomic or negated, well, let, let, let us say it like this. An atomic formula, an L-ring, let's say atomic L-ring formula, <coughs> what is it? In, in, in the variables x1 to xn, y, what, what, what can it be? It has to be an equation because the language has no relation symbols, right? So the only thing that I can do is equality between two terms. This is the only possible thing. But what are terms in the language of rings? Polynomials, right? Polynomials with integer coefficients, right? Absolutely. Now, if I have an equality between two polynomials and I have in my language uh, minus, I could put one polynomial in the others. I mean, let, let me write. An atomic L-ring formula is of the form is of the form a polynomial one in variables x y equal to a polynomial two in variables x y with p1 and p2 polynomials with integer coefficients right okay now this formula of course is equivalent to saying p1 minus p2 is equal to zero in the in the language of uh, rings right in any model of my theory t in any algebraically closed field this formula and the formula saying just p1 minus p2 is equals to zero are equivalent so i can reduce this formula to saying just one polynomial is equal to zero right <clears throat> okay, we recall more or less what KFR, what, what the setting is. Okay. Sorry, I need to erase what we're doing, but we have no space. Okay, I'm going to erase everything. Since I can erase the theorem, we also know what we're proving. So since uh, T already satisfies that, uh, let's say for every X, for every Y, this formula, right, is equivalent to this one. I mean, what I'm saying is a triviality, but I'm... Then we only need to take care of formulas of this form. Of atomic formulas of this form, just one polynomial equal to zero, right? We only need to take care. We may assume, right? We may assume that the formula theta ij xy, recall this is the negation of an atomic formula, sorry, an atomic formula or the negation of it. But the negation of this formula is just putting that the polynomial is different than zero, right? So we can assume that this formula is of the form <clears throat> a polynomial, which I'm going to call just pij. It depends on these indices, x, y, equal to zero, or the same thing, but say it is different from zero. These are the only two possibilities for my formula theta of x, y, right? It has to be an atomic formula or negated atomic formula. We just said that all atomic formulas look like this. So I can only, instead of saying that the difference of two polynomials, I just put this difference into just one polynomial. This is my polynomial, p, i, j, x, y, and this is equal to zero or negation of such a formula. And this is just, I'm being different than zero, right? So the formula that I have here is a conjunction of these two things. If you want to think now geometrically, this is basically you're saying you're a, a locally closed Sarisky set, right? You're the solution of some polynomials and you're also uh, in an open Sarisky closed set, uh, in an open Sarisky set, right? 
Okay. Now then, let's let's try it. Then uh, let um, right. Okay. Then the formula. Let me put it like this: the formula phi. Um, I wanted to say, okay. Suppose B, for example, is an element of K such that um, B satisfy all this conjunction, right? Such that uh, K satisfies um, the conjunction over J for a fixed I, right? Of uh, Theta i j a b right where this i zero is fixed that is no 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 the negations are inside I'm gonna put them here you can put all the negations together and then you say this one breaking algebraic geometry and there is that's true there is just one there is one and then and then you use the graph construction to um and there is then no negation. And that, that, that's one idea. That's one idea. We, we can show it without this, but that's that's an idea. He's, he's trying to say that you're you're not zero if if you have an inverse, right? And you want to put a new variable. This is basically the new I, I agree. I agree. I agree. Actually, let's prove the new Stellensatz with quantifier elimination after we prove it. That's beautiful. Let's 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 have a proof of the Nordstein sets using this. After we prove this, basically we have a a proof of the Nordstein sets. I I think this is a, a great. You will not use Nordstein Of course not. I'm going to use just quantifier elimination. I'll give you one proof. I think it's a. I I forgot. I I I think it's in the notes, and I forgot I I should present this now that you remembered. I this is something we absolutely need to do. <clears throat> okay. Yes? No, so, sorry. Uh, it seems to me that you are done, right? Because your value lives in uh, the abstract closure of the fraction field of P, right? Uh, which is contained in both fields. Exactly. I, I, I absolutely. Well, no, 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 no. Let, let's be more prudent. Let's be more prudent. Yes, it, it could happen that it could happen that all of these formulas are just negations. So I'm saying that we belongs to none of the zeros of locus of these polynomials, right? For example, it could happen that B is transcendental over A, right? But there we use that any algebraically closed field is infinite. So we have enough room in F to find an element B, which is not in, in these polynomials. But you're right, this, let, let's, let's divide into these two, two cases, right? <clears throat> So what we're saying is, is something like this, but let, let me write it. That is, we're saying that uh, if, I mean, if, <clears throat> if these formulas are satisfied for B, this means basically that we're saying that for some of these polynomials, uh, B is a solution for the polynomial after I replace the variable X is by A. So it is a solution if, 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 if this, if this atomic formula is really appearing. And if not, I'm saying that B is just not a solution, right? This is the only thing I'm saying for a bunch of polynomials, right? So let's split in two cases. Either <clears throat> my set B is algebraic over K, uh, sorry, over A, or it is transcendent, right? Transcendent. So case one, if you want. <clears throat> If, uh, let's say, if um, for some, oh, actually, let me write it like this. This is I0, you're correct. If B is algebraic um, over A, then Um, then there is <clears throat> there's going to be well, actually you can take the algebraic closure of A 
in let, let me let me write it like this you then you have you have a just the identity this you can extend it to the fraction field right and this I'm, I'm i'm thinking of it this as a subset of k this is a subset of f right but you have here an isomorphism between the two fraction fields this is unique right <clears throat> but you have also an isomorphism to their algebraic closures this is soren's lemma then you can also extend it to an isomorphism of their algebraic closures inside this one inside f and this one inside k since we know that k and f are algebraically closed these algebraic closures are really subsets of them right because these two by assumptions were uh, algebraically closed we assume that they were models of my theory right then this means that <clears throat> if b is algebraic b is going to be here and my isomorphism is going to send it here and now an isomorphism is going to preserve all formulas here but these formulas are now without quantifiers so they really move between uh k and f between these substructures let, let, let me write it down perhaps a little bit more clear exactly they need to satisfy exactly the same polynomial so in this case <clears throat> the image of b under this isomorphism satisfies that f satisfies the same the same formula so satisfies this conjunction the image let's call it b prime right satisfies all these all these all these either polynomials or inequalities between polynomials right yes not well oh, this this nothing would be okay, okay, yeah, this is just the identity on a yeah, which yeah. is present in both f and k then i pass to the fraction field in in both cases and then i pass to the algebraic closure but to the algebraic closure inside these models and then this is the important part this isomorphism can be always built here i'm using a theorem of algebra right i'm using a little bit i'm hiding a little bit of algebra that you can always extend an isomorphism to the algebraic closure but this is a these other two uh, are also isomorphism or... so this is the identity this is an isomorphism and this is another isomorphism this is not identity because i'm taking the algebraic closure inside potentially different fields so this is not necessarily the identity right h the same h is not well technically perhaps it's not the identity because i am taking is, the, is it the identity Mm. perhaps no right I, I don't think so but it is an isomorphism that's the only thing that we need it's uh, i mean the fraction field is um right you're taking in k right you you don't for example k has a copy of q right and f also has a copy of q but you don't know well Perhaps this is there is an automorphism of, of Q between these two copies, right? It's just not of Q. One goes to one, two goes to two. That's true. And then you're right, you're right, you're right. Not of Q. Yes, but if, even in A, okay, perhaps this is still the the identity. Oh, you're right, you're right. You're right. I agree. This 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 has to be you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. This this one is. I agree. I agree. This is still the identity. The fraction field is really the, the same in both. Isn't it? Eki, Eki has some, some doubts. Yeah, I think it's not the identity. I'm sorry, but the 
like we get camera and then start recording. But what's the what do you want to be the identity? The first one is the identity. The first one is the identity. Yes, because the, the structure is just present in both. It's a substructure of both. It's not exactly, is it? Yeah, but the fraction field is just the, the division by, oh, no, 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 you're right. It's just not division by, okay. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is, well, the fraction field is just. Um, exactly. I agree, I agree. Yes, but, but A already exists. So the, the pairs have to be the same, I think. Well, exactly. I agree. Let, let's let's follow Eki. It, it doesn't matter if it is the identity or just an isomorphism. The only thing that we need is, is an isomorphism to to continue the proof, right? And we can discuss later if the fraction field is <laughs> identical or not. Okay. Okay, so there we, we can find uh, an image V prime which satisfies the formula, right? Now the case two is that uh, suppose now uh, B is not algebraic, so it's uh, transcendental over uh, A, right? This means that no such formula like this appears, but all the formulas that appear are like this. Right, I'm just not the equal to the zero of a polynomial when I replace here B and A, right? So this is um, K satisfies the conjunction P A J zero, right? With J here, uh, A B is different than zero, right? But now all these polynomials, now notice that now that each polynomial, each polynomial P I zero J I as a polynomial. Now with this parameter, this is a polynomial, doesn't matter. This is a polynomial in just F Y. It is a polynomial in both. It is a polynomial, of course, in in K and F because it only uses um, coefficients in a common substructure, right? So each such polynomial can only have finitely many solutions at, at most, right? So each polynomial like this has uh, only finitely many solutions. Right. So consider the set in F of all the solutions of those polynomials. Right. So consider you agree that it has only finitely many solutions. It's a polynomial in one variable. Right. This is a polynomial just in one variable. When I plugged in A, this is a polynomial just in one variable. It has to have only finitely many solutions. Right. So now let 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 me call it perhaps um, X be the subset of F of all solutions to these polynomials to well to, to sorry the union I should say like this the x in F B the union of these sets I take the union of the sets of all x's in F such that oh, let me call it different uh, C's in F such that phi, this is an inner J of A, C equals zero, right? This is just my set X. Is this union, the union of the zeros of the first polynomial, the zeros of the second polynomial, and so on. But you can still be doing the same, the algebraic closure of the fraction field, right? And because you're not truly transcendental. Saying yeah, you're the solution set, and the solutions actually belong to that field. Right? I, I I agree, I agree. But but it could I mean it could happen that this B is is truly transcendental. This could happen, right? I agree. But but ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, you're yeah, you're yeah, it's a 
not solution of this equations and then you need yeah yeah i, I, I you. you have to <coughs> say that then there is not solution in the algebra exactly i i, I don't need no, to no, construct no, no, to okay we, we don't need to construct a transcendental element in f perhaps there is none but the only thing i need to construct is an element in f which satisfies these formulas that is the only thing i need to construct is an element which is not a zero of all these polynomials but do this is, is easy because all these polynomials, since they give me a finite set, my algebraically closed field is infinite. I have enough room to find someone which is not a zero of all these polynomials, of none of these polynomials, right? No, which is finite. Now, since F is infinite because it is an algebraically closed field, There is B prime in F, which is not in X. And therefore, F satisfies uh, the same thing, right? It satisfies that B prime is not a zero of none of these polynomials. And this finishes the proof, right? OK. Let me show you now the Nullstellen test, right? I think this is a, it is a super fun exercise. So with the criterion, let me give you a couple of observations before you go into the Nullstellen test. So this shows quantifier elimination for the theory of algebraically closed fields, right? Note that. This theory, we said this theory is not complete. Let's be quite careful about this. This theory is not complete because we said there are algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero and there are others of characteristic two or three. So even if this theory eliminates quantifiers, it is not complete. Yes. But we can use this to show that the completions are precisely just adding, specifying the characteristic. Let me, let me explain you why. So recall that at the very beginning of the of the of the lecture, I said <clears throat> if you have quantifier elimination and any two models satisfy the same quantifier free sentences, then the theory is complete. But here this is not the case, right? Because not every two models, not every two algebraically closed fields satisfy the same quantifier free sentences. For example, there are ones which satisfy one plus one plus one plus one equals zero. And there are others which do not. But once we add these sentences, either one of these sentences or the negation of all of them, we get a complete theory. So a corollary again, this we, we proved it already using, using categoricity, but, but a corollary is that uh, ACFP or P equals zero or P prime is complete. So indeed, note that, of course, this theory is a, is a subset of this one, right? In, in this one, I just added more axioms, right? So if this eliminates quantifier, of course, this one as well, right? Because eliminating quantifier, well, it's preserved under undergoing up in theory. If I add more axioms, I'm, I'm still eliminating quantifiers because any model of this theory is a model already of this one, right? So ACFP has quantifier <coughs> elimination. Now let's show that for this one, if I take any two models, they need to satisfy the same um, quantifier free sentences. Yes. Yes. The 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 part saying the characteristic. So. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. This this one is. This thing is ACF union. 
let, let me write it. Let me write it. So for prime for p bigger than zero, this theory is just this theory union one more sentence that says that one plus one plus one p times a equals to zero. This is just this theory. This one is just this one union one more sentence. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. ACF sub zero is ACF together now with an infinite number of sentences, which are the negation of these ones for each P, right? This is one plus one plus one is not zero. This is P times. But I do this for every P prime. Right? This is a longer collection of sentences. Okay, and we know what this ACF was, was just saying that I am a field and say that every monic polynomial of degree D has a solution, good, in one variable. <clears throat> okay, so now let us prove that it is complete. So this one has quantified elimination. It, we only need to show that given two models, they satisfy the same quantifier free sentences. So it is enough to show to show that any two models of ACFP for P also possible here zero satisfy the same <coughs> quantifier free sentences, Eldering sentences to be more precise, right? <coughs> right? Now, what are the quantifier-free sentences? What, what can we say? Already, it, it is quantifier-free, so it has no quantifier, so it has to be a Boolean combination of atomic formulas, right? So if uh, phi is a quantifier-free sentence, it is of the form or equivalent right to one which is again a disjunction of a conjunction of atomic or negated atomic right so here i put again atomic or negated atomic but here i only put theta but because i cannot have variables this is just theta ij right this this has no variables at all because i am a sentence right and i have no quantifiers so what can I say with an atomic sentence in this case in, in the language of rings? What are what are the only the only the only atomic formulas that you can form in this sentence in this language? I recall you the language. The language of rings is it has plus minus multiplication zero and one. What do what do atomic formulas look like? Like this, right? I mean, a term is going to be something of the form, perhaps one plus one plus zero minus one, the whole thing times one, perhaps, and then an equality, right? And then the same thing on the other side, times one times uh, one plus zero, or something like this. But I, I will never go out of just ones and zeros, that's it, right? Here I'm going to have something which is either a natural number n and on the other side two. And since I have um, um, subtraction, then this is going to be at the end only a formula of the form this equals zero, right? Where n, I'm just saying this is, okay, let me write it like this, one plus one plus one equals zero, and here's some natural number, right? But since this, the two models I am taking here have the same characteristic, they need to satisfy exactly one of these formulas or none of them. So they do. They do satisfy exactly all the same uh, quantifier-free sentences. So this shows that these theories are, are complete if we prove quantifier elimination, right? Okay. 
So this is okay. Sometimes this is perhaps important to to acknowledge because it is possible for a theory to eliminate quantifiers but not be complete, right? Here, the the the, the theory which is really eliminating quantifiers is this one, which is not complete, but it helps us to show how to complete it. What do we need to really complete the theory? So this is something that we need to look in the quantifier-free sentences. And we know that for fields, the quantifier-free sentences are very simple. Just specifying the characteristic, we're done. We completely describe the possibilities of, of two models satisfying exactly the same um, quantifier-free sentences. OK? Which sentences are there? These ones. Except for this one. This right. One for, for some n. I mean, of course, the sentence can be like this, but this is equivalent to a sentence of this form, right? Yes. Uh, ACFT has uh, a in Asia. Uh, is that because uh, the added sentence is uh, on or No, not necessarily. This is just because of this. So um, we said that having quantifier elimination is just that T, let's say, in the, in the case, let me put the case of ACVF. ACF, right? So I, here I put ACF, and ACF already implies for any formula, right, that the formula phi of x, right, is equivalent to psi, and this one has no quantifiers, right? But then the same has to be true for ACF p. Exactly the same thing has to be true for ACFP because suppose the only, this means if I have a model of this theory, it is a model also of this formula. Let, let me write the formula again. Right? So I, I want to prove you this. Right? So I give, you give me a model of ACFP and I need to show you that it is a model of this. Right? But any model of ACFP is in particular a model of this one. So it has to be a model of this one, right? It's just because this is a subset of this one. I'm not really using anything about the extra formulas that I put. This is a superset. Yes, this one is a subset of this one, right? OK. I have one remark and one question. Go. So what we have done is to prove uh, some strengthening of uh, Chevalier theorem. So Chevalier theorem tells that the, the, projection. Uh, the projection of the constructible subset is constructible. And, yes. and we have proven that if that con constructible subset, subset can be defined with uh, integral rotation polynomials, the projection must work. That's correct. And uh, the question is the following. That's correct. Imagine that I want an strengthening, but not over C. I want a, over a number. Field. So I fix a number field. Yes. And can can you can you do the proof of quantifier elimination that you have done over uh, F? Uh, adding parameters, <coughs> uh, adding constants to the language of rings in such a way it works for a number field. You can. Yes, you can. So this version of Chevalier theorem is true. Uh, very well. Absolutely, absolutely. And notice, okay, let me. Yeah, this, this is because the, the 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 proof that we just sketched changes nothing. The only ch thing that changes is that you know that f is going to be contained in your substructure a, because you're building everything over f. So you added. Um, um, parameters, I mean, you added constants over F. And the only thing that you know is that both algebraically closed fields need to contain a copy of F inside. But the proof won't change at all. Now you're taking a, either an algebraic element over your structure, substructure A that contains F. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good remark. Let me do quickly. No, yes, yes, yes. So, he, he, what, what, what he's saying is that. You have the following strengthening of Chevalier theorem. 
Corinthians says that the image of constructive what is constructive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, let, let. Furthermore, you know that the uh, polynomials defining the constructible can be defined over. Uh, Okay. I, I want I want to do a precision because then it depends how you're phrasing Chevalet. Because Chevalet, it, the way you phrase it says the image under any morphism. And we only show this for projections. Yeah. Right? We only show the projection of a constructible set over Z is constructible over Z. By constructible set, the, the only thing I mean is a no, no, Boolean no. combination of Sarisky closed sets. Number field, I can take the graph construction and then do a honest projection. Okay, but right. You, I mean, you need an extra argument you, you to. Need the to be the over the number Absolutely. Otherwise, Otherwise no. Correct. That's correct. So it's not right. It's not any morphism, right? Because the, you need to include the morphism. You need to see this morphism okay, as. The issue is that the morphism is defined over the number field. Absolutely. The graph is defined over the number Absolutely. Field. Absolutely. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, let me show you quickly the Nullstellen set because I still want to. Sorry, quick, quick. quick. Yes, go. It was weird, but like you mentioned that the ACFP. Yes. Uh, K and F, which two ACF? They form, they, they fulfill the, exactly the same L sentence, L ring sentences, but the, these sentences also include unequal or only equal. Both unequal and equal, right? And, uh, why? Why do they exactly the same sentences? Well, if so, if you if you have k and f models of ACFP for either p equal to some prime or zero, right? Then this means that either they satisfy both this sentence or they satisfy both the negation of all. Right? This was the definition of ACFP. Right? Then, since we saw that any quantifier free sentences in the language of rings was actually of this form for instead of P, perhaps on N, right? If your field already satisfies this one, it cannot satisfy any of the other formulas like this for N different than P. This is just the theory of fields, right? If you are of characteristic P, well, <clears throat> right. You, but if you satisfy that two, that two P equals to zero, the other one too, because both are of, of characteristic P, right? But it cannot satisfy any other of the sentence for a different prime P, right? Because you cannot have characteristic two and three at the same time, right? Okay. Then, they must satisfy exactly the same quantifier free sentences. Okay. Okay. Now I'll, I'll, I'll show you the, the, what is called the weak Nullstellen sets, but it is known that these two are equivalent, right? So uh, let K be algebraically closed and take I be an ideal, which is not the whole thing, a proper idea, right? I, let me put it here, it's a proper idea, right? And we need to show we need to show that I has uh, some solution. We need to show that um, there is uh, B, let me call it A1, AN in K, such that um, P of A equals zero for every um, P in A. Right, and, and this, right, correct. Okay, this is the, the weak form of the Nullstellen sets. Says if I take any proper ideal in an algebraically closed field, it must have a point. Right? You agree? 
Okay, then uh, right. Okay, then since this is not even. Let P1 up to Pn generate I, right? So it suffices to show that I have a solution for this P1 up to Pn. If I find a solution for P1 up to Pn, I have a solution for the whole ideal I, right? Now, since I, um, is not the whole polynomial ring. Let M be a maximal ideal containing I. Right? Then by this is this is called the uh, Kronecker's theorem. This, you can do it by hand. This extension, I mean, you know that this polynomial ring modulo m, now it's a field, right? And you have an extension of field, but moreover, you have that your polynomials have a solution here, right? Actually, just x1 plus m up to xn plus m are going to be a solution. Uh, and P1, Pn have a solution in, let, let's call this one F, in F. This whole field is F, okay? Now, this implies that P1, Pn also have a solution in its algebraic closure. So I have a K, I have F, and I have the algebraic closure. Right? You agree? Yeah. Now, now look at this. Um, Let me, right, let me think for a second, but note, let me write it like this. Note now that uh, um, K and F alg are two models of my theory with, with a common substructure in common, which is just k, right? We have, uh, let me see, it like, like, let me put it like this. These are two models of the Dirac algebraic closed fields. This is these are two models of the theory of algebraically closed fields with a common substructure. In this case, the common substructure is is k, right? But this one. F, the algebraic closure of F, we said that it satisfies this formula. There exists X1 up to, there exists Xn such that there are a solution of all these polynomials, right? So this one is going to go down to to K as well, right? K has to satisfy as well this, this formula. And in this way, we just uh, show that the- you, you didn't use completeness. I didn't, I just used quantify elimination of here. Completeness is hidden that these two fields, of course, have a common substructure. So they, well, they are two fields of the same characteristic. So 
but I didn't use really completeness. You're right. I did it too. I, I, I focus the same characteristic and then they have the same sentences and this is the same. Ah, this is, this is, this is crucial that this is wrong because these polynomials have coefficients in K. These are not polynomials uh, with coefficients in Z. So we need to be a little bit more precise. Yes, yes, yes. So the idea is to, I mean, hidden, let, let, let me state this part a little bit different. Perhaps it, it, is, it is clearer if I state it this way. So before you move, uh, yes. So here you're saying that notarian implies uh, finite basis, right? Absolutely. Notarian in this case implies that any ideal is finitely generated. Are they equivalent or just one direction? I think this is I, being notarian to every ideal has, I, th I think this is equivalent, yes. I think this is equivalent, yes. Second question, P1 until Pn have a solution in F. This is only because that uh, any uh, polynomial Pi here is actually zero element in this uh, field F, right? Well, under, under, no, no, no. This. Because they are in M. What? What? This is a solution. This is a solution in here for those polynomials. The image of those polynomials in this uh, quotient uh, in this field, it's already zero. Mm, that's not I mean, a polynomial is not directly zero. A polynomial is just a polynomial, right? The polynomial remains to be just that polynomial. But what you find is that in this field, these elements are a zero of the polynomial. And this is because of the reason you're saying, because when you, well, you, when you put all of them in, inside the polynomial and you use, I don't know, the binomial uh, coefficients, all of them are going to vanish, and what remains is going to be an element of M. This is essentially the proof, but it, it is not that the polynomials are zero, right? The polynomials remain to be just polynomials and are not the zero polynomial. Well, I mean, there is a difference between the following. Taking a polynomial over this field, right, and try to seek for these polynomials if this is a, a solution or not, right? If, if, I mean, K has an image here, which is just the constants, right? No, 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 I mean, the polynomials, let, let me give you an example, right? If, if you have the polynomial X squared minus one equals uh, zero, right? This is just a polynomial in K, right? Suppose this is a polynomial in K. Sorry, this is the polynomial in K, right? Now, this polynomial remains a polynomial in this field because one and one are still sent to one here, right? I really mean K here and the, the I mean, here I'm sending a polynomial, an element A to A plus M. Right, and under this identification, I still get uh, polynomials uh, in both sides, right? Yes. Okay, but an image of PI can't induce the uh, image already. Okay. Correct. Okay, let, let, let me now state a little bit better what I just said, quantifier elimination implies, implies the following. I, 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 I somehow hide it in why, what I said here, but quantifier elimination implies that if I have two models in general in the end, if I have, I mean, T having quantifier elimination implies that if I have two models of my theory, if one is a substructure of the other, then it is an elementary substructure. Okay? So this is quite strong. Having quantified elimination has this implication that being a substructure for models of the theory implies already being an elementary substructure. This is very strong, but 
it's an easy consequence of quantifier elimination. This is because indeed, I need to show that now formulas transfer in general, right? But formulas are equivalent to quantifier free formulas. And we said that quantifier free formulas transfer here. So, okay, let me not write it, right? Then what we were having in this, in this proof is that <clears throat> here I, I have K, which is a model. This is also a model. Then this is elementarily uh, a, so an elementary substructure. So even if I have polynomials in K, which have solutions here, they, they go down. Okay, this is perhaps an easier way to, to see it. It's a nice, nice little proof of the Nuschtelen sets. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this is the shorter proof, right? I mean, we did one whole week of model theory to prove this. I'm not saying this is better than just doing algebra. And I mean, we use already notarianity. We use quite a bunch of stuff to show this. But could you repeat again? So we, we found that M is a model, uh, in our case, K is yes. a model of uh, elementary, uh -huh. right? Okay. Then, oh, yeah, yeah. then okay. this means that that any formula with parameters in K, which is true here, has to be true here. And this is why we can transfer uh, solutions of polynomial with coefficients in K from this one to, to this one, right? Yes. So this does not come out of the completeness, right? No. No, we, we, we did not use completeness in this theorem. We only use quantifier elimination to be, to be, to be honest. <laughs> The structure means that uh, they satisfy the same formulas. But with elements in K, this, this means that for every L formula, in this case, L ring formula, right? I just forgot the definition. It's okay. I, I, I write it down again, right? Of this form and elements A in here, the formula transfers, but I only quantify over elements in the small one, right? So if K satisfies phi of, uh, oh, sorry, I, I only need phi of X, phi of A, then this is if and only if F satisfies, but in this case, the algebraic closure satisfies phi of A. And the formula we were using here is there exists a solution for a lot of polynomials. And this A are the coefficients of those polynomials. Okay. Okay, now I'll I'll introduce one more uh, kind of abstract concept and give you another criterion of, of quantifier elimination using this notion. So basically you can think of these criterions as the criterion that I'm going to put next looks longer and quite ugly but is helping you in the proof of quantifier elimination to be, to be easier. So we're going to put more assumptions on, on our models. Like in the criterion I just said, I just give you two models of the theory and one substructure, and you need to transfer an existential formula from one to the other, right? Not knowing that it's just an existential with a quantifier free formula. And now I'm going to give you more. I'm going to say, you can actually assume more stuff about these two models. And if you still show the same, you get quantifier elimination. But these extra properties of the two models, now I need to define you what these are. This is some, something called saturation. So the definition I have was that a map between two elements, structure is an elementary embedding if it preserves all formulas. So exactly. how this should be interpreted? Right, preserving formulas means this. So if you have your H between M and N, Preserving formulas means precisely that for every formula phi of x and every a in M, you have this implication. M satisfies phi of a implies n satisfies phi of h of a. 
right? But note that if you preserve all formulas, since you preserve negation, this becomes an if and only if, because you also preserve negation. But the quantification here is for every. Yeah, but the formula. No, but you're plugging here the parameters. So the formula is, for example, the formula is, for I example. Put one variable for each coefficient. Exactly. You put one variable for each coefficient. Exactly. Exactly. OK. OK, now this is types and saturation. Okay, let me give you the definition. Um, <clears throat> so let T be a theory. And let's say X is just X1 up to Xn. Okay. Um, a partial, let me call it. So I am sorry for. It's yes, okay. But I think the formula that you should have written then, you would have a variable for each coefficient. And one. You would say some for all, for the coefficients, for all. No, no, no. I, I don't need the for all. So the formula is, let, let me give the formula for the moment just, okay, let, let, let me write it. Suppose. So the formula that you wrote is not the formula. Let me write the formula. So suppose P uh, I of X one up to X N is something like this. Is a, a, a sum of A, i x i where i is multi-index right i is uh, i one up to yeah. i n right then what i what i have is a formula this of these variables i have a lot perhaps n right because i have many 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 things so the formula i'm, I'm looking at is something like y one up to y a very big n this point is not the position. exactly and this formula is something like this sum y i x i equals zero. Right? This is the the formula theta. Let's say I, I just declared this formula that my formula theta, which is basically just changing in co each coefficient in this polynomial by, by a variable. Right? Then the formula says uh, I said the following: the algebraic Closure of F satisfies this formula. There exists X1, Xn, such that actually I should need, let me do it just with one polynomial because, of course, I need theta for each. This should be like theta i, right? Then here I put theta i. Here the variables, I replace the variables with the actual coefficients because of k, because this is an extension. So it contains all these elements from K, right? It contains all these, I mean, the AIs are all coefficients in K, right? We, we choose these polynomials as polynomials in K, right? So I can check if this formula is true for these polynomials. And here I, I, I right? I, I, I just replace, for this formula, I replace all the coefficients. Since I know this is true because it has a solution in Falch, I can go to K. OK. Now let me tell you what the partial type is. A partial type is the following. It's just a, it's a, a set of L formulas. Which I write p of x uh, such that p of x union t is satisfiable or has a model. 
has a model. It's the same. Okay, so what I'm saying is that um, you, you can think of these x's if you want as, as new constants or just things that I need to give an interpretation to. Okay, and what I'm saying is that a type is some set of formulas which can be satisfied in some model of T. Okay, let me give you some, some examples of this. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I, I won't be able to discuss real closed fields. <laughs> as I promised you, but perhaps in the discussion after we discuss a little bit. Otherwise, I won't be able to give you the background you need for next week uh, properly. Okay, so let, let me give you an example. Suppose, for example, you have... Um, Let me give you the um, just the, the theory of the natural numbers, if you want. The theory of the natural numbers with uh, addition, multiplication, minus zero, one. Not minus, just multiplication, addition, zero, and one. Okay. So I have this. This theory is my theory T. Right. Suppose consider this type. I want the following type. So type is the set of formulas saying x is bigger than uh, 1, x is bigger than 1 plus 1, x is bigger than 1 plus 1 plus 1, and so on, right? I add, this is just the, the set of the collection of uh, formulas saying x is bigger than any possible integer, right? Well where when I write n, this means just 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times. Let me write it like this. Right? This is just a collection of formulas. Oh, sorry. Let me put the order so that <laughs> I have a symbol for this, for the order in the natural numbers, right? So I, I, I put all these formulas, right? So certainly there is... Look, there is, of course, no element in the natural numbers that satisfy all these formulas at the same time, uh, at the same time, right? Because, well, there is no element bigger than any. So all, all of have sentences. These formulas, no, because they have one, one variable, right? This is a variable. This is like a new, new constant, which is not in my language. Means putting existence here, no? no, satisfiable here means you, you can think of this formulas as being sentences with where x is just a new constant. This is another way of seeing it. You can think of it as this is before satisfiable was for a theorem. And the theorem Correct. Is a correction of sentences. Exactly. So you can think of it as so you, you I totally agree. The doctrine of satisfiable. I agree, I agree, I agree. This is a, this is a, this is you're, you're totally right. What I mean this is 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 this for uh let, let's call this L prime an extension of L, which is the, just this language, right? The language uh, plus times uh, the relation uh, less or equal zero one. This L prime only adds, this is L together with a new, with a new constant if you want, right? And what I'm, what I'm writing is instead of this variable X, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this constant. So, the, the, you can you can think this as p of c saying the constant is bigger than one plus one for every for every n. Okay, so this is something like now this is really an, an uh, a collection of this is a collection of l sentences, right? L prime sentences. So in general, I use that uh, l constant. That's correct. That's correct. If you want, we write it like this. It's just that if you look at, I, I mean, I completely agree with you. This has, it, it, it should have been written with constants, but the way model theories do in any book is that they use again variables. This is, I agree, this is not the nicest way to write it because 
we use variables precisely to distinguish between sentences and not being a sentence. But this is the way you're going to find it in books. So I'll better prepare you for that, right? If if you see people writing types, they will they're going to write it instead of putting new constants, they're going to use variables. But what it means is exactly what you have in mind. It's just you extend the language by perhaps n constants, and you need to say this new set of collection, I mean this new this new L theory is consistent. Okay, or satisfiable. And in this case, it's, it's not difficult to see that this thing is going to be satisfiable. Why, why do you think so? Yes, this example, where T is, is this theory. How, how would you prove a given theory in any language is satisfiable? What is the only tool basically we have? Well, we have perhaps more tools, but what is the main tool to show that something has a model? Sorry? Make one. make one. I agree. If we make one, we're done. But there is an easier way. <laughs> I mean, we're going to get one just by almost by free, by one big theorem that we talked about. Compactness. If we show that any finite bit of this set has a model, then we know the whole thing has a model, right? And showing that finite pieces of this has a model is easy, right? Eki already told us more or less how to do this. He said, like, okay, if you take a finite bit, I only need to interpret this constant as a very large natural number, and the natural numbers are, are already a, a model of this finite piece, right? So this means that you can have models of this theory, right? So things like look very much like the natural numbers, but have infinite elements, right? Because any thing, any model of this of this set is going to contain one C, which is bigger than all the natural numbers, right? Wait, but you fix the C at the very beginning? Exactly, but I fix the C. But then when you say every finite model, how, how can you control this word every? It could be well, when, when you prove that every finite part of this set has a model, you give me a finite part, and I'll show you that it has a model. But the C is prefixed at the very beginning. It's How can you guarantee that this C really is, is okay for every? No, 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 no. This is, I, I fix the C, but for every finite piece, I'm going to interpret the C in a different way. But the compactness, the magic of the compactness is that if you find for every such finite piece at least one interpretation, the C can be interpreted in different ways, then you know that there's going to be a model of the whole thing, right? Exactly. Absolutely. But why? Because you're going to take a finite uh, set of these and you're going to model them and you're Ex going to evaluate the new model? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? So it's not one model, sorry. No, it's not one model. I mean, to show that this is that this whole thing has a model when we use compactness, we don't need that directly show that it has a model the whole thing, right? We only need to show that each finite piece has a model. This is the, the magic of, of compactness, right? Okay, so these are sets like this are going to be partial types. So those are um, ways in, in, in which you can extend kind of your theory by elements. You can think of this, for example, in algebraically closed fields, you could add a set of sentences for a given C saying that it is transcendental, right? Just add the sentences saying, I am not, well, transcendental in this case, perhaps just over, over Z. Right? You can say, I am not the zero of this polynomial, not the zero of this polynomial. And then you will find an algebraically closed field, which has at least one element, which is transcendental, right? This is totally possible to do. Um, the definition of type is not with respect to T or something. Absolutely, absolutely. Because here we said that. Uh, Right, right, right. This, this, this type, so a partial type 
over t, right? This is a, a partial type with respect to the theory t. You're right. Okay, so now let me, so this is a kind of an abstract concept, but let me now give you the next definition. So let kappa uh, be uh, an infinite cardinal. We say a model of T, M of T is um, right, okay, kappa saturated. If for every subset, A of M of cardinality smaller than kappa, every, I'll, I'll explain the notation I have here, every LA type is realized in M. Let me explain you all the words that I, I have written there. Plenty, plenty of words that I haven't defined. So the first, the first one is, is, is this part. So we say that a type is realized in a model if I can find an interpretation of these constants in the model which make these, all these sentences true. For example, we just said that the, the type that I mentioned here cannot be realized in this model. But there are other models in which this type is going to be realized, right? But in this case, it's not realized in this one, right? Okay. Now, this part about the LA type is this just means that I allow parameters from A in my formulas. So this just means allowing parameters. from A in the formulas, in the sentences, let's say. So the language has new constants for every... Absolutely. This language has new constants for every element, one constant for every A in A, and they're interpreted in M in the canonical way, right? Correct, exactly. So, for example, so being saturated is a very strong property. It's saying that if, if you have this strange collection of sentences, for example, this sentence saying that you're bigger than every natural number and you are, let's say, um, even just Aleph zero uh, saturated, then you're going to have points that satisfy all these sentences in your, in your structure. So these are very rich structures in, in a sense. Um, yeah, I know this is a, a difficult concept and I, I, I won't have a lot of time to give you the uh, a right intuition of how to think about this saturation, but let me, let, let me give you perhaps an example of, of, of something which is saturated and something which is not saturated. No. No. The, the C is something which is outside all these languages. The C is a very new constant, totally different from all of these cases. In the previous type was just an L type because I didn't use any constant for elements in N, right? I only used already the constant symbols that were in my language, right? Let me give you an example of an LA type, right? For example, this one. Take um, and to be just the complex numbers in the language of rings, right? And consider this type. Consider, let's say you consider Q uh, a joint uh, square root of two, for example, right? This is just, uh, let's call this A, right? 
I'm going to add to the language of rings all possible constants from here. Actually, Q, I was almost already having it, but square root of two, I really don't have it at hand in my language, right? Now consider the L A type P, let's say, of C, right? Where, where C is just some other constant, new from everything that I just added, right? Saying that I don't satisfy any polynomial with coefficients in A, right? So this says uh, P of C is different than zero for every polynomial with coefficients in this A, right? Now, I, I didn't write it, but these new formulas are formulas really in this language. Of course. Ah, of course, sorry. <laughs> and then Q, let's call it F. Right. So this, the point is that these formulas, since this polynomial can have coefficients here, these are really LA formulas because I'm using parameters. I'm using really parameters to be able to talk about the coefficients in these polynomials. Sorry. <laughs> yes, it's just an element of AX, right? So, for example, this type, it only says um, I am transcendental over A, right? Is this type realized in the complex numbers? It is, right? In the complex numbers, there is enough room <laughs> to make this, uh, to, to find an element which is transcendental over this one. Actually, this is a countable field. Its algebraic closure is also countable. So since C is uncountable, it has to have elements which are not in the algebraic closure of this one, right? So this type is realized. This type is realized oops, in C. And we can say actually. True. True. Exactly. This means let, let me write this. This means there is B in the complex numbers such that when I replace C by B, C makes true all these formulas, right? This means C satisfies all these formulas. Sorry, F of B is not zero for all these Fs here, right? Yes. So, so the natural numbers are not even zero satisfied, zero saturated. They're not even zero. The natural numbers are by far not saturated for any <laughs> cardinal, right? C is actually two to the Aleph zero saturated. If you take any countable, actually well, Aleph one saturated, I don't want this to, depend on the continuum hypothesis or anything like this. If you take any countable set of parameters, any countable subset of C, and you give me a type over these parameters, C is going, is going to realize it. This is not totally trivial to show. Perhaps you can try to show it using quantifier elimination because types are going to be not too difficult to describe because well, quantifier elimination can help you there. But C is going to be an example of a saturated structure for this K to be Aleph 1, okay? The real numbers, for example, is, is not a saturated structure. Similarly, because of the, of the example with N, you can write a type which says, I am bigger than zero, but smaller than every one over N. And this is easily, um, it's easy to see that this is going to be satisfiable again by compactness because for any finite part, well, you find the epsilon which is smaller than all these elements and still bigger than zero. But then the reals don't have an element which is 
infinitesimal in this sense, right? It cannot be smaller than every one to over n and still being bigger than zero. So the reals, for example, are not going to be a, a saturated uh, or even Aleph zero saturated uh, structure. So it's every L A type over T. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Over T. Thanks. Yes. Absolutely. Over T. What is T greater than epsilon? Over. Let, let, let's be a little bit more precise. This is over. Okay. I'll, I'll be precise and explain you why, but I don't want to get into these t details. This is the theory of M. And here I put an A because I want that these A's are really interpreted in every model as the A's of M. I don't want the other constants to be interpreted in a strange way. I, I really want the, the the part of M that has A, I, I want it to be kind of fixed. Then it should be over this theory. What is usage of this T over of the second? Well, that M is a model of T. What is T? You're, you're, you're right. I, I, I could delete this in, in, in the definition of, uh, of saturation, right? Because so M is just the unexpected. Exactly. You're right. This does only depend on the theory of the structure, not really on 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 the theory. It is a model of. You're right. Yes. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around the definition of, of uh, a type. Uh, yeah, I I, so, I know it's difficult. Sorry for. So uh, no, it's okay. So what's the difference uh, between uh, a, um, a, like a type? Yes. And let's say uh, an extension of a theory. Nothing. Okay. But, Nothing. But well, well, I mean, no, one, 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 one direction is nothing, and the other is is something. Let let me explain. Yes. So, any type is just an ex extension of a theory, but of a very particular kind. I'm only adding into the language new constants. I could extend the theory by many, many different ways. I could add new relation symbols or new function symbols or other stuff to the language, right? Here to the language, I'm only adding finitely many variables in this case, right? Uh, sorry, finitely many new constants. And they take formulas in this language, sentences in this language. And those are types, right? But, but you could extend the theory in, in, in many different ways, right? You agree? You use X. I use I just so X, but you can put constants, constants, right? Constants Absolutely. 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 No, Absolutely. If if you if you go to a model theory book, you're going to see variables, but think of constants if if, if this is clearer for you, right? Yeah. And the point is that you want to uh, find models of this where you need to now um, interpret these new constants or the variables if you want but, right i mean they have to be constants if we want the new thing to be a theory right? absolutely we have to be a set of sentences right? absolutely absolutely i, I totally I'm agree basic, no 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 no, no. <laughs> i totally agree i mean the the fact that you're actually uh being uh picky about this means that you're understanding the subject <laughs> oh, <I'm glad. laughs> no no no, no. It, it, it is true i mean the the, the books are a little bit not so formal about this, but but this is you're totally right. Otherwise, this is not a sentence, and and we just define theories to be sets of sentences. And in this respect, you're absolutely right. It's just uh, this is the way they they write it, but but you're absolutely right. Yes. If we like going back to the the previous example, if we want to, or this one actually, if, if if we wanted to not use compactness, would it be enough to just uh, make this construct this new model with an extra element, and then we would just have to check the axioms of. Uh, of uh, Absolutely. The, uh, well, the difficult part, the way I stated with with n, the difficult part is, is is that I put the full theory of of n. This is difficult to check. <laughs> but if I only put arithmetic, then yes. If I only put just a type over piano's arithmetic, then absolutely yes. You need to find a model of piano arithmetic which has an infinite element. This is totally fine to show that this theory is, is uh, consistent or satisfiable, right? 
but for um, I guess for, for the definition of saturated is like we're actually taking automatically the full theory of whatever model. Exactly. Is. So maybe that's if if it has if it can. I mean, if it's um, like finitely axiomatizable, then we then it would be easy. But um, otherwise, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Otherwise, we're kind of doomed to use compactness. Kind of. You're right. You're totally right. Okay. I guess we can. Yes. Example, we're adding this C yes. to, to, be, to, to, to be a new uh, constant. Variety. A new yes. constant symbol. In L. Even we are adding it to this one. We're saying we have this, this language, and we, we're adding a full new constant symbol. And this is the new language of in which we're looking at these sentences, right? Those are sentences. In this new language where I added constants, not only for every element of A, but also a new constant symbol, C. Right. Uh, a, you add a new constant for every element in A? Exactly. Exactly. And what do you mean by parameters here? That's exactly what I mean by parameters. Mm -hmm. So allowing parameters means precisely that I'm adding a constant symbol for every element in A. To L. To L. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, I, I haven't I haven't given you yet this new criterion for quantifier elimination using saturation. I will give it to you after the break. I think I will I will be very brief about about this criterion. Perhaps we won't have time to apply it once. If you want, we can apply it once very quickly to algebraically closed fields, even if we're not going to get any new because we already know that they eliminate quantifiers, but just to to see how this works in, in practice. And then later we go to valued fields because you need to get something of valued fields before next week. For me, it's also also good. Let, let me give a state the criterion and perhaps not use it, okay? And if you want to ask me about how to use the criterion, we can discuss. Nevertheless, you're gonna use it next week in a, in, a, in a difficult way, but the criterion is not going to change, okay? But I'll, I'll like to state it at least once so that you see more or less the picture that you have, okay? Let's have a break until half past 11. In essence, it's, it's very similar to, to the way one constructs algebraic closures in, 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 in the theory of fields. So you, you need to solve somehow a lot of a lot of um, problems, right? And then you start, you're going to build a huge chain of structures, each one dealing with each of these problems, and then you end, you're going to end up with a kappa saturated structure, which is going to be perhaps of cardinality huge, but the point is that they, they exist. You can always build one, okay? So this is just to, to tell you that even though it's difficult for me to, given a theory, give you a, a, a kappa saturated structure, we can always build them by, let's say, by brute force, right? Just trying to enforce that I, each time I realize each type that I can write. Okay, this is a kind of a chain construction, very similar to the way you you try to construct um, algebraically closed fields. So, for example. You start by adding all algebraic elements, but then since you added new new things, you added new polynomials, and you need to redo this, and you need you need to redo this a couple of times. Very same procedure uh, is used here in order to show this proposition. Okay. Now let me give you the a second criteria to to know that a theory has quantifier elimination, and it's going to be very very similar to the one I give you now. But it, instead of starting with just two models of my theory T, I'm going to start with two models which are saturated, right? So I know a lot of, about these models. They, I know that they they have solutions to a lot of problems in in to a lot of kind of uh, sets of, of of formulas in my language. Of 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 these two, you mean? In this one? No, it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, N, N is an extension of 
Okay, so yes, that's correct. But I'm only saying that it is kappa saturated. So, so I'm. So right. for example, I, I I could take m to be the complex numbers and kappa to be aleph zero. Right. So, I'm only saying that I have an extension of the complex numbers which is aleph zero saturation, right? So, this kappa might be quite different from the cardinality of m. That's that's correct. So, right, so what, what I'm going to write next is basically the same uh, criterion that I just uh, uh, have, uh, that, that I just have written before, but now assuming that the two models of the theory I have, they are um, saturated, okay? So the property was that, recall that if, if, if we were having a common substructure, right? then I can extend somehow existential formulas to one into the other, right? This is exactly the property which I'm going to have here, but I'm gonna write it slightly different, which is not having a common uh, substructure, but that there is an isomorphism between two substructures, which is essentially the same thing, right? So I'm going to write it this way. The property, let me call property, this property star. This is if, there are isomorphic. And in the definition of types, the variables that appear in P of X must be free. In the formula. Exactly. They must be free. must be free, otherwise this is impossible. Absolutely, absolutely. This is why it's better to write it with constants, with new constants, so that you know these variables are never going to appear. That's correct. So if there, sorry, if there are, Uh, substructures a i of m i for i equals one to two. So let let me do a picture. Perhaps this is better. Here I have m one. Here I have m two. Here I have a substructure which is a one. Here I have a substructure which is a two, and I have an isomorphism h between them which are isomorphic. With, let's say, an isomorphism H1 from A to A2. And this isomorphism is such that it preserves already quantifier free formulas. Let me state this. And H preserves between M and N quantifier-free formulas, right? In this case, I think this is obvious, right? This is contained in the definition. Sorry, uh, let me. Oh, thank you. This is kappa saturated. I think I don't need actually to to state this, right? Because this is this is directly because of the notion of of substructures, right? Yes. Suppose that you have substructures which are isomorphic. Uh, then for every for every B in M1 minus um, A, right? For any, any, any element that I have here, let me put it here. B, A1. A1. I can find another B prime here and extend H to an H prime. There is there are, let me let me say it like this. Perhaps I need to take now some A1 prime here and A2 prime here, such that I can I can extend my isomorphism to a new isomorphism also containing B and B prime. Okay. There are uh, H prime 
substructures on of of um, MI such that which are isomorphic. Let me say like this, and an extension H prime that goes from A1 prime to A2 prime. Let me continue here, which is an isomorphism. My B is contained in A1 prime. And of course, this, this uh, well, if it is an extension, I, if H is an extension of, uh, of this map, I know A1 prime has to contain A1 and uh, has to contain, uh, A2 prime has to contain A2, right? So basically this is saying, ah, I forgot something important here. These substructures, of course, this is the most important part. These substructures need to have cardinality smaller than kappa. So basically what I'm saying is this. If you give me two substructures which are of a small cardinality, this means just being smaller than kappa, I can extend isomorphisms to any given B in M1, okay? If you can prove this, the result is then <laughs> the theory T has quantified in H. Exactly. If, if kappa is a left zero, this means you have here a finite, <coughs> um, well, as, as a substructure that is going to be uh, at least finite, right? If, or at least generated by finitely many elements, then you need to, right? You need to extend isomorphism between finite structures uh, to any other structure, right? Well, <clears throat> let, let's, let's, let's be a little bit more precise. Um, Perhaps make it, making a good point because then this is going to be, is this, give, give me a second, let me, let me think for a second. Mm Right, sorry, but here, here kappa, I am taking it to be strictly bigger than a zero. So kappa cannot be a zero. Otherwise, of course, this would make no sense for just for finite here. I need to be at least this to be, well, for example, if, if, if I'm using the language of rings, there is, there is not going to be, if, if, if my rings are, or I'm, I'm, I'm Seeing, thinking of the theory of fields of characteristic zero, there is not going to be any substructure which is finite. So this would be true automatically, right? Because there is no such AI which is finite. Everyone is going to contain Z. So this has to be bigger than bigger than Aleph zero for this to make a little bit of sense, right? So. Let me just give you the, the, the idea of how this could be used in, 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 in the case of algebraically closed fields. The proof is the same, it's morally the same, but we are assuming more about the two algebraically closed fields that we have here. So recalling in, in the proof that we gave, the idea was I was having this K here and this F here. Now I have two substructures uh, which are um, uh, isomorphic, right? Let's think of this just in, in, in the case of algebraically closed fields. So suppose these two fields are algebraically closed and I, I have two subrings which are isomorphic, right? 
Then we know, for example, that this isomorphism extends to the fraction field of both. This extends, this is H extends uniquely to the fraction field, right? And it also extends uniquely to the, well, now let's pick 1B here, right? We again split in two cases. If B is algebraic, then this is going to be contained also in the algebraic closure, and this extends also to the algebraic closure. So we can extend the map B to some B prime in an easy way, right? If the element B that I find here is transcendental over A1, I really need to find a transcendental element B prime here. But this is where I use saturation, because being transcendental, I can say it in a type right over this set of parameters a2 so since this one is saturated i'm going to find a real transcendental element in this structure and then we know that uh well these two fields a1 with the transcendental elements a2 with the transcendental element they remain isomorphic so this is the way you can extend always an isomorphism between any b here you can always find a b prime here up to extend an isomorphism so the only thing that changes in the proof is the assumption that the fields that we're taking into consideration have this saturation assumption. And this helps sometimes in making a proof a little bit easier, okay? But the, the technique is more or less the same. You need to somehow extend to an element here, satisfying a formula, or in this case, an element here, such that we know that we already have isomorphic substructures find an element here such that we can extend this isomorphism, okay? This type of proof you're going to find it next week at some point, okay? Using not just algebraically closed fields, but other models of a given theory that you're going to, to check. So in the, in the previous question, you don't have to prove it for every M1 and M2, I'm sure only for if they are saturated. Exactly, absolutely for a cardinal which is big. That's correct. I guess next week you're going to you're going to to see this with a given theory of valued fields and the kappa you're going to take is Alef1, I think. And you're going to use this criterion to show some quantifier elimination statement. Okay? This is actually an if and only if. You can show this is also an if and only if for Q. Yes, that's correct. OK, now in the rest of, of this course, we're going to talk a little bit more about valued fields and something which is called multi-sorted languages. This is a very fancy name for something that is very easy, OK? It, it looks scary, but I assure you that it's nothing that uh, a formality that we're going to, to try to deal with. Let me deal with first this multi, multi sort uh, uh, thing, and, and later we go to valid fields. So we saw, for example, for vector spaces or even modules, that we were using a language that was, let's say, for example, for Q vector spaces, we were using a language that was a language of Q vector spaces, was uh, addition, um, subtraction, the zero, and we were having a unary function for every scalar, right? But this fixes the field in which we're taking the vector spaces. So this 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 is this language, if, if I write now the actions of vector spaces, this are going to be only Q vector spaces. I'm doomed to just see it Q vector spaces, right? It would be nice to have the theory of vector spaces in general, not just Q vector spaces, but just vector spaces over a field, right? And then it would be natural to have vectors, but also the elements of the scalars also as present in, in my structure. But this 
seems to be just two different sets that I need and not just one structure, right? This is what we're going to use. This is basically the idea that we're going to try to capture. So we are going to give two sorts, two different type of elements. And then now our structures are going to have, instead of just one universe, two universes, okay? One for the field elements and one for the vector elements, okay? So a, for example, a two sorted language, or even, it's, let me call it the two sorted, uh, sorted language of uh, vector spaces is something like, that looks like follows, is uh, a language with two sorts. We call these sorts, okay? Let me call one sort, I'll explain you what this means. One sort, I'm going to call it the field sort. And let, let me use perhaps, I don't know. Let me call it SF. And the other one is the sort for the vector space, right? And then this means, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain. This means I'm, I'm going to have, now recall that my structures before were something like this. M was a non-empty set M together with the interpretation of the relations and the interpretation of the function symbols and the interpretation of the constants, right? But these relations were only subsets of some powers of M. These functions were uh, basically something that goes from some power of uh, M to M, and these were just elements of M, right? Now, if I have two sorts, I can have relations which are uh, subsets of products of my two sorts, not just of M, but now of things of the sort field and things of the sort vector space, right? So the same for the functions. I, I can have functions that go from products of them to one of them. I'll, I'll try to explain. So it has two sorts and uh, the following symbols, right? And it has also addition, but addition of V. It has a symbol, which is the inverse in V. It has the zero in V, but it also has the whole ring language on my field sort. It has also the uh, addition of F. It has the, the inverse in F, the multiplication of F, uh, the zero in F and the one in F. And finally, I have one new symbol, which is a symbol that is going to mix my two sorts. This is scalar multiplication. This is a new symbol that I'm going to perhaps put just as a dot with, with, with no uh, subscript, right? So now what I was calling here in the usual uh, um, language before the RT relation, right? The RT function, the RT was just giving me for that's that that's the whole language, exactly. That's the whole language specifying that I have two sorts. So the language, if you have if you want to be more precise, would be something like one sort, two sorts. I, I specify the sorts. So the, the sorts are part of the language. Yes, you need to you, you need to specify the sorts in the language together with the symbols, right? And part of the language is also to define you the RET, right? I need to define you these symbols. For example, before I was saying this is a relation of RETs of RET n, right? Now I need to, or for a given function, for, for example, before in the language of rings, I was saying plus is a function of RET2, right? Now that I have sorts, the RET function is a little bit different. I need to tell you kind of what product exactly of these sorts is the RET. So for example, for this one, for now the RET of uh, addition in V, I give you exactly the, the sorts. This is this sort, if you want this sort, and this sort, because this is a function that goes from SV times SVF, sorry, vector spaces to 
vector spaces, right? I'm, I'm trying to think that this function is taking two elements of my vector space and gives me also another element of my vector space. So I try to specify as a function, the last, the last part of the function tells me where is the sort I arrive to and the other, what is the product of sorts I start with, okay? Exactly. It's it's a function. Well, no, the arity now is a function that goes from these symbols, right? For every symbol, I'll, I'll give you the arity, and the arity now is just actually I should put it like this. Sorry, not a set, but uh, an ordered uh, an ordered tuple, right? And this ordered tuple is telling me how I should interpret later this symbol. I should interpret it as a as a true function from. Uh, the power set of, of the set I'm going to interpret this sort with to that sort, right? Let, let me give you the other example. This one for, no, let, let, let me write this one, for example, the, the arity now of, uh, of the multiplication in F, right? This is going to be just, well, the sort field times the sort field to the sort field. The only place where this is going to change a little bit is the scalar multiplication because this is going to be now of sort, I start with a, with a scalar, but I apply it to a vector and I, I end up with a vector, right? Mm -hmm. So basically we just allow now to have not only one set here, but perhaps several different sets, each one corresponding to a sort. This is how we call them. In this case of, uh, of vector spaces, we have a sort for the field and a sort for the vectors, right? And we can put, notice that if I restrict this just to the sort of the vector space, I only have, exactly. For the relation is exactly the same. I just put a tuple and then I have to interpret this relation as a subset of precisely this Cartesian power between these, between the sorts of the tuple, right? It's, is this more or less clear? It's kind of a generalization, but not too complicated, right? I'm just saying now I, I allow to have two universes in parallel and I can have relations between them and functions between them and that's it. I can also have the functions I was having before, right? If I restrict myself in this language to the sort of the vector space, what I end up is just having the language of groups, for example. And if I restrict completely to the sort of the field, I end up having the language of rings. The only new thing that really came was this one, which is mixing the two sorts, right? Okay. What is interesting is that, of course, now, uh, studying now, if I, if I write axioms for the axioms, for the, the I'm sorry, if I if I write that theorem with the axioms of vector spaces, now what I'm going to end up is really with the theory of vector spaces in general. I'm not fixing the field, the underlying field. This for sure is not going to be a complete theory, right? Because we have already fields of characteristic zero and fields of characteristic p, and so on, right? You will need to write, for example, axioms for being a vector space over an algebraically closed field of characteristics zero. This is going to be, if, if you write that your um, vector space is infinite, this is going to be a complete theory, but well, otherwise you still need to do now several choices, right? I mean, you, in order to have a complete theory of vector spaces in this language, now you need to do more stuff, right? So <clears throat> this idea of, of multi-sorted languages is, is is this? Let me give you. Um, so now you understand more or less what is a, what is a, in this case. Okay, let, let me call this language, language of uh, vector spaces in general, right? Let me put a two here to know that we have two sorts, right? So let, let me just explain you that any. When you write formulas, the variables automatically are interpreted by the. Exactly. This is important. When now when I I write. Exactly. Now, when I, I write uh, formulas in this language, each variable is of a, a specified and distinguished sort. Each time that I write x, I need to tell you 
which type of variable this is, right? Uh, automatically. I, I cannot write, for example, an element. If, if this is, I, I, I won't write it. I mean, in, in general, I, I would say something like we use xi for variables of sort uh, of the sort field, right? Of the sort sf, and let me use the yi's for variables of sort vector space, right? I should not be able to write in my language um, in my language something like this because this makes no sense. I am saying that an element in my field is equal to a vector. This makes no sense at all. I can only use equality between uh, two variables or terms in the right sort. I cannot use equality between things which are in different sorts. Equality is restricted just to things on the same sort. Okay, so one needs to build formulas in a proper way, putting equality in the right sorts, right? I cannot use, for example, I cannot say something like uh, um, <clears throat> the one of the field is equal to one times, uh, this is one of the field times zero in my vector space, something like this, right? This makes no sense because this is a field element and we know this is the zero vector, the zero vector right? So this, this would, won't be allowed to be a sentence. We need to just put equality between the right, uh, the terms of the right um, sort. What's the question? Yes. Um, yeah, so the, the sorts, um, well, I'm going to ask you, I guess, something that you're going to explain now, like what are the models you're going to do this, no? Like, exactly. Like so the, said, uh, like let, now let, the source is going to be substituted. When you, let's say, evaluate it in a model, Suddenly, one sort becomes the field, and the other becomes the Absolutely. Sort of Absolutely. So, okay. so any in this case, and any LVS two structure, right, <clears throat> is now two different non-empty sets, one for each sort, and then an interpretation for each of these symbols, right? <clears throat> is uh, let's say the data of Two non-empty sets. One is let, let let me say it like this: is the interpretation of of this sort, right? And this is just a non-empty set. This one and let me call a structure M, right? Now uh, an LV structure M is now the data of I need to give you two non-empty sets like this. Right, and for example, for this one, the interpretation of the interpretation of of this symbol here, right, is just a function from this set times this one into this one. Just an actual function, right? I guess we didn't need. Uh sorting one sorted languages because it was clear exactly but exactly uh, so we are implicitly using it. Ab ab absolutely because uh, th there was no needing to distinguish between between two sorts we were just having one but if you want to think about it what we did the whole course was thinking in one sorted structures right now <clears throat> let, let me tell you this as follows everything that we proved in this course holds that holds for the, the one sorted structures holds for multi-sorted structures. Everything, <clears throat> everything is everything. Almost, okay. Everything we we checked in the course does. So the, the um, criterion for quantifier elimination, completeness, uh, ultra products, exactly the same. Uh, you can build ultra products for uh, multi-sorted structures and multi-sorted languages. Everything just works exactly the same. It's just very painful to write it down, right? Because you really need to do it for, you take formulas. Now every formula has variables distinguished for each sort. So this is very painful to write, but nothing changes, okay? So compactness, the compactness theorem still holds for this sort of, uh, this sort of, this kind of uh, multi-sorted uh, languages, okay? And structures.
So you can still use exactly the same tools by working with this uh, with these ones. And it allows you to treat in a more natural way vector spaces, for example, or other mathematical structures that you might think of that have naturally like modules or other mathematical structures that have naturally two different kind of sets and an algebraic, for example, um, uh, relation between them, right? So this is what I need to tell you about. Yes. Yes. If instead of adding the constants like we did before, notice notice that that when 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 I when we were studying this, just as a one in 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 one sorted, just as we did before. We never specified the field, right? We're just studying the class at the same time of all algebraically closed fields of characteristic P. If you want to do algebraic geometry, well, depends on what you mean by algebraic geometry, right? But if you want to study solutions of polynomials in a given field, but independently of the field, you're perhaps studying just the theory of fields. The problem is that the theory of fields is not complete has no quantifier elimination, and it's a theory which is very difficult to, well, kind of derive something interesting out of it, which is perhaps non-trivial, right? So, yeah. what? <clears throat> Not really, right? Because a scheme, well, you, 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 you can think, <laughs> if it is a scheme of finite type, you can think of this as a, Kind of a, a formula saying some polynomials are equal to zero, right? You can try to think of the scheme as exactly this formula, and you can check if this formula is true or not in in some fields, right? Right, right. Okay, for for I'm 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 saying you for an affine for an affine scheme, and then if you want to 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 glue, you need to you need to do something. I I agree. That's correct. Okay, so now let's uh, turn into valued fields. Okay, and valued fields, we're going to see valued fields. We can study them in, in many different languages. And some languages are going to be these multi sorted languages. So, you know what a valued field is? Shall I? Let, let me recall the definition since. I mean, the whole the whole next week is going to be about about valued fields. You you need to know a bit about about this. <clears throat> okay. So valued fields. So definition. A valued field. Um, we write this usually KV, right? Is the following data. Is the data of uh, a field K. <clears throat> Together with the map V that goes from K to gamma union infinity. Now let me tell you what this is, where gamma is an ordered um, abelian group. Infinity is just an element which is bigger than every element in gamma. Uh, infinity bigger than ele any element gamma for gamma in gamma. And this map satisfies the following conditions. It satisfies 
three properties. First, oh, V, four properties. V is surjective. I should have said it before. Let, let me put it this with a surjective map. So I have a surjective map from K to my ordered um, to my ordered uh, abelian group. So this is when I say ordered, I mean totally ordered. Okay, this is a totally ordered abelian group, and it satisfies these three properties. First. The only element which is sent to infinity is zero. This is infinity if and only if x is zero. This is the only element which is sent out of my uh, valuation of, of this group, sorry. It is a multiplicative map. So it's going to, a product is going to be equal to the sum of these two elements, let me say for um, x and y, which are different than zero. Otherwise, we know that this has to be infinity, right? So for any invertible elements, non-zero elements of my field, evaluation of the product is the sum of the valuations, right? And finally, we have an enhancement of the triangle inequality, okay? The triangle inequality usually says that, it would say something like the valuation of the sum is uh, bigger than, well, it's smaller, right? But you, you, you're, you're putting absolute values and here the valuation is kind of reversing the arrows, right? then this is going to say that usually you take the sum of the valuations, right? But here we're putting something stronger, which is, which is taking the, the minimum. Let me say the valuation of the sum is bigger or equal than the minimum of the valuations. And this last property is called the ultrametric inequality. Ultrametric inequality. Okay, this is a strong form of, of of the triangle inequality. If you want to think of it this way. Okay, so this is this is a valued field. This is the definition of a valued field. Basically, you can. I mean, there are several ways in which you can try to think uh, of a valued field. But one way is to think that it is kind of um, leveling or uh, right, kind of labeling the, the, or putting into a hierarchy how big the elements of K are. This is not a, a full ordering, right? This is not defining a, a total order on K, but it's telling you, okay, perhaps there are elements of valuation zero. There are elements which are a little bit bigger, which are of valuation an element of gamma which is bigger than zero and and so on right so this is kind of uh, making a hierarchy of how big an element of k is by by this group uh, gamma okay so that's the definition of evaluation um let me give you some examples of course there is the well the trivial valuation this is not uh very much uh, interesting examples. Taking gamma to be just uh, the trivial group, right? Then, uh, and K any field, right? And K any field, the, the function just sending v sending any element to zero if x is not zero and zero to infinity is called the trivial valuation is evaluation ah right so a, a, a bit of, of, of terminology so when you have a valued field 
the map V is called uh, evaluation, right? And this group here is called the value group. Let me let me write this in a yes, totally ordered. I I didn't write it, but I say it. I yes, it's a totally ordered. Linear order. Linear order. Yes, correct, correct. So. So this is evaluation, uh, which we call the trigger one. Okay. So we're not very much interested in the trivial valuation. This is not uh, very much interesting, but at least it is making any field into a valued field, right? Just by taking this valuation. Okay, let me give you other examples. So recall this, this gamma is called, let me perhaps put it in some, in some color. This is called the value group of this pair KV, okay? Okay, let me give you the valuation, a nice valuation on the rational numbers. So let uh, P be a prime number. Number, right? We define the p-adic valuation as, as follows. So we define the p-adic Valuation on Q on the field of rational numbers as follows. Let me define you first this for a given integer. Uh, for an integer a in Z, we let the valuation, the p-adic valuation of A is going to be equal to N if and only if uh, A is of the following form. I write A, well, by the fundamental theory of arithmetic, A is just a multiplication of prime numbers, right? And it's going to have some power of P, right? So the where let me write this here where p does not divide p anymore. So this is the biggest power of p appearing in the prime decomposition of a, right? And this is the n that I put here. So the exponent of the biggest power of p appearing in the decomposition of a. This is its p-adic valuation. Okay, how big with respect to p it is. For example, P itself is going to have valuation one, P squared is going to have valuation two, uh, and so on. But if P is three, then two is going to have valuation zero, for example, or five is going to have valuation zero because, well, three does not divide five, right? So the valuation is telling you how much is your number divisible by P. This is the, lip, the, the, the hierarchy that we're making is, Elements which are very much divisible by P are higher than elements which are less divisible by P. This is basically what the valuation tells you, right? So this is enough to define it for Q because since it has to satisfy this, ah, of course I define it for A non-zero, right? For A different than zero. For A zero, I need to define it as infinity. I have no choice, right? For A equal to zero, the valuation of A has to be infinity because I need to be evaluation, right? Zero cannot go to anything else than infinity. And if I'm not zero, well, I know this integer is well-defined. Okay, and now for elements in Q, this is totally imposed, right? Because if, if my valuation is multiplicative, then I have no choice how to define 
for a over b in q, right? Uh, let's say irreducible, right? We define the, the periodic valuation of a over b. How should it be defined? The difference, right? Because if it is multiplicative, this has to be b minus a minus the periodic valuation of b minus b, right? Because, well, precisely because it is multiplicative. We have no choice to, but to define it this way, okay? Now, I let you convince yourself that this map is indeed evaluation, right? We need to prove these two, these two conditions, but this is a nice exercise to play a little bit with the prime p. And you're going to use at some point that really we need a, a prime number somewhere, okay? So this is this is evaluation in 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 um, in Q, okay? Let me give you more examples, and I come back to this valuation later. Note that all um, ah, right. What is the what is the value field? Uh, what is the value group here? Is it right? In this case, the value group is is just the integers. It's just the integers. That's correct. Okay. Another useful uh, example is. Uh, Consider better. Let K be a field and consider the theadic valuation here. The theadic valuation on the field of rational functions of T. Okay, is the function. Sending, let me call this P of T, right? Yes. So if it's reducible, you consider the corresponding irreducible one. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. If you don't take the irreducible points, you're making it so right. the fraction is. Well, the problem is that no? the problem is that I, I could multiply by P in both sides. Yeah, it's, it's ah, right. you're right. You're right. There is no problem. Actually, I, I don't need the irreducible. You're totally right. It doesn't depend. Absolutely. This was uh, taking care too much of something that does not need to be taken care of. I agree. You're totally right. Now let me define you the theadic valuation. So the theadic valuation of a given rational function, right? Well, since this is a quotient and the valuation has to be multiplicative, it better be just the theodic valuation of, of P minus the theodic valuation of Q, right? You agree? So I only need to define the theodic valuation for polynomials. Basically, what I'm saying is that if I know that a field is the fraction field of a ring, I only need to define the valuation on the ring because it automatically extends uniquely to the fraction field, right? To quotients because it needs to be multiplicative. So it, it suffices to, to define what is the valuation, the theodic valuation of a given polynomial, right? So suppose uh, P of T is the following polynomial, it has sum up to degree D, let's say, of uh, a i t to the i, and let's say it really has degree d with uh, d, sorry, with a d different than zero, right? Then um, what do I want to say? Right. So the theoretic valuation of p is uh, uh, M, let's say, where M 
is the minimum smallest uh, integer between zero, let's say m in zero and d, such that a m is different than zero. Mm, no, no. I think I I think I want this one, right? So, for example, if your polynomial is has a constant element, then it has valuation zero. But if your polynomial is something of the form t to the three minus three t squared, then the first uh, monomial which has non-zero coefficients is uh, the one with the power of two. Then this is going to have valuation. Okay, this is the theoretic valuation. Mm. This also extends same definition. Let me put it, not, not be fully uh, fully formal here, but similarly, similarly defined for formal power series over a field. Now you have a formal power series. You're taking uh, uh, the valuotiadic valuation of a formal power series is just the exponent of the first uh, uh, monomial, which is not zero. Okay. Now those are, I mean, to show that this is a, a, a valued field, of course, you still need to prove uh, that it satisfies the, and of course, for the zero polynomial within the two infinity. So in these examples, you still need to show um, that they satisfy the axioms, but I ensure you that this is that this is the case. Okay. Now in these examples, perhaps in this one, in this one, in these two, let me let me show you something that perhaps um, perhaps is is, is useful. Um, you, you can see these as 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 norms. I mean, you, from from evaluation going to let me write it. If evaluation, if a valued field KV is such that your group gamma, right, is a subset of the reals, then you can kind of dualize this construction and see the valuation as an absolute value. So you can, you can see KV as a normed field where the norm Let me call it now. This is a norm which is going to be dependent on this v, right? This is is the following one. I need to I need to think uh, mm, how we do this. I think we take um, just the exponential, right? Defined, right? Exactly. Defined as. Uh, In this case, you can take any any number. I can take e or two or whatever. It doesn't matter. Some choices here for p matter for something, but bigger than one. As um, for example, let, let's take e. Doesn't matter. Uh, as the value, the norm of a given element a is just let's say okay two to the minus the valuation of a. Okay, and then each of the for example the property. Let, let me. Let me write it. Uh, I think checking that this is a norm is automatic. Okay. Yeah. Just, 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 just to let you know, I mean, the, how any of these proper the properties that I that I wrote, for example, the property of being that the that the valuation of a multiplication is sent to the addition of the valuations is precisely showing that the norm is multiplicative in this case. 
right? This is just the exponential process addition to multiplication. Exactly. This is just the, exactly what Javier says. It, it's process addition to multiplication when, when we're doing, doing exponentiation here. That's correct. So if you see it as a, as a norm field, you could take also its completion with respect to this norm, right? So in the case of the of Q1 and the Piadic norm, so for uh, Q equipped with uh, uh, the Piadic norm, right? Which is just sending, let's say, two to the minus the Piadic valuation of A, right? Uh, its completion, just the, the, exactly the same way you construct the real numbers with the usual absolute value as a completion of Q with the with this uh, usual act, uh, absolute value. We take now Q, but we complete it with respect to this new norm. So its completion is what is called the Piadic numbers. It's called QP, the field of Piadic numbers. Okay, so do you have seen this field before? Some of you, someone has never seen this field at all? You, okay, I'll, I'll try then because this, these fields are going to be your bread and butter next week. <laughs> I'll better perhaps tell you a little bit later about, about these fields, okay? Because they're going to be the object of a whole course next week. So this is important. Uh, exactly the same construction here. So if, uh, if we take, let me just write it like this. The completion of just the field of polynomials of rational functions, sorry, uh, with the coefficients in k over t with respect to the theatic norm, with respect to the theatic norm. Anyone knows what this should be? That one, exactly. This is already the completion. <laughs> is the field of uh, formal power series. K T. Isomorphic to at least, right? So those are going to be used at all, uh, I mean, very much next week. In particular, when we take here the finite field FP, right? So it's important to notice that um, this, I, I should try to perhaps explain this a little bit, but. The completion of the Pulsar power series is very interesting. Absolutely. And you allow real exponents. Exactly. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying the completion of the field of Puiser of Puiser series. Yes, yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right, you need to take now real exponents. But even if the field is the complex numbers, it's not, it's not, com it's not complete. Well. Ah, you mean the exponent, take a real number exponent. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, let, let, let's. Let, let me postpone this discussion about uh, the formal field of uh, formal physio series. Uh, we can have it later. Okay, let, let me give you now 
some important invariants that you have in a valued field. This is going to be also very important. So let um, K ah. let K be in a valued field. Then um, we have the following interesting sets in a valued field. We called, I think, usually it's called O. Sometimes it's called R. This is called the valuation ring. And is the set of elements in K which have valuation bigger or equal than zero. This is called the valuation ring. Okay. The valuation ring has a very nice property that you can think of it is that for any x in k, either x belongs to the valuation ring or its inverse has to belong to the valuation ring. Let's, let me put it like this. Right? This is very easy to check. It's just, well, if you're bigger than or equal than zero, that's okay. But if you're smaller or equal than zero, and since this is multiplicative, then the inverse has to be in, okay? And this is of course a ring, it's called the valuation ring, but it's in particular uh, a ring, a sub ring of K, right? And it has a nice feature is that it has a unique maximal ideal. So it's unique. Let me write it like this, O has a unique, maximal ideal, which corresponds to so notice that this has no model theory. I'm, I'm just doing algebra for you for you in this in this in this moment. So this ring has a unique maximal ideal, which is actually usually denoted by M. And this is the sets of elements in K, which have valuation strictly bigger than zero, okay? And if you have a ring and a maximal ideal, you know that the quotient is a field, right? This is what is called the residue field of your valued field, the quotient. So this is called the maximal ideal, right? And this quotient, Let, let me write this hand perhaps like this. It's written in the literature also with different letters. So I'm just taking one notation. The quotient like this, this one, it's sometimes referred in the literature as little k when your field is big k. Sometimes this is, one uses little k. This changes really from author to author. I'm perhaps giving you the notation that will be used mostly next week, okay? It's called the residue residue field. So there is a clash of uh, of terminology. This has nothing to do with residue fields in algebraic geometry. This is the the the, the, the quotient of the valuation ring and the maximal ideal in a valued field. It has nothing to do with the residue residue field at a point in the scheme or anything like this, right? This, it's called the residue field. We have nothing to do with uh, this clash of terminology, right? It is, <laughs> okay, perhaps it has something to do, but I don't want it to be confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perhaps. I, I agree, I agree. Okay. About? Ah, okay, okay. I was, I was, I, I think I agree with this statement more than with the other, yes. <laughs> what is not, they're not spherically complete. This is a different notion. And I think the spherical completeness is the one you're saying. I'll 
perhaps have time to define you this notion as well. Okay, so <clears throat> of course you have a you have a topology in a valued field, a natural topology which is given by bolts, right? So any valued fields, any valued field is actually <coughs> a topological field, right? Any valued field KV is a topological field. Uh, where a basis for the topology is given by the bolts, where a basis for the topology let's say on K is given by open bolts. So a ball, let's say, or you take an element gamma in your value group and the point in k then let's say the ball of radius gamma centered at a this is just the set of all elements in k such that the valuation of uh, x minus a is strictly bigger than gamma right this is See, if you if you think of this as norms, right? This is saying something like similar to the norm of x minus a is smaller than well two to the minus gamma or something like this, right? So this is really the translation of the usual norm that you have in a norm field, right? Those are the the balls, right? Now, however, you need to really change your your mind about this ball because they behave totally different than balls, let's say, in the reals. Note, any element in a ball is a center. So for example, if uh, another A prime belongs to this ball, then the two balls are equal. This is something that does not happen in the reals at all, right? In the reals, you can have a ball centered at A. You pick honor A prime, and I take the same radius. Well, these two balls are for sure different, right? In valued fields, this is not happening. Any other center here gives me the same ball. And this is because we have this a strong triangle inequality. Let me show you this because perhaps this is useful to, to think about these this, this objects. The topology is a strange topology. It's not the usual, it's very different to the, to the topology of the order or the Euclidean topology in, in the reals. Uh, let's prove this. So if, um, if a prime belongs to the to this ball, then what we have is that the valuation of a prime minus a is smaller or equal than sorry strictly smaller than gamma, right? Now we want to prove. Let us show one direction. Let's let us show that the let's say this ball is included in in this one, right? We should be the, the strange, right? Then from, let's take an element here. Let X be an element in this ball, right? Then this is by definition, right? If and only if the valuation of X minus A prime is bigger or equal than gamma, right? This is just by definition. Now consider let me prove this direction. Consider the sum valuation of um, x minus a prime plus uh, a minus x, right? Consider this, this valuation, right? This is for sure the valuation, just the valuation of the x's uh, go away, 
right? So this is just evaluation of, let me write it like this. This is just evaluation of uh, A minus, A prime minus A. You agree? Sorry, A minus M prime, right? But this is actually the same as the evaluation of A prime minus A. This is not difficult to see that. This is using that the evaluation of X is equal to the evaluation of minus X. This follows from, from the axioms. If, if you want, we can also prove it, but it's not too difficult to prove this. So these two are going to be the same, right? But then let me put the arrow here. My triangle inequality, right, says that this is um, bigger or equal. Am I doing the right, the right direction? I hope. I want to show that. Well, let, let, let's see. This is the minimum, oh, right? At least bigger than the of x minus a. Exactly. Exactly. Or v of x minus a. Right? But then this means that, um, right, if this is the minimum, right? So if, if one of them, well, we, we know I took an element in, am I doing? things the right way perhaps no right let me let me think for a second um perhaps i add i add up something i didn't want to and let me let me think in for a second ah you're right with the norm the right let, let, I, I think you I think you were correct. I think you were correct. Sorry. What I need to put is x minus a prime. No, I want I want to show actually that uh, yeah. it is in this one, bro. So I, I want to show this one and I want to do this one. Uh, this one is correct, right? Uh, minus a plus a prime minus a. I, I I think this is I this is going to work. Minus a prime plus no, no, a no, prime no. minus a. Ah, right, 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 right. Prime, prime. I think now it's going to work, right? So this is just the valuation, I agree. This is just the valuation of x minus a, which is what we wanted to know if it is bigger or not than gamma, right? But now I use the triangle inequality. This is bigger or equal than uh, the minimum, right? Of maximum is with the <laughs> valuation of x minus a prime and valuation of a prime minus a, but both of them are bigger than gamma. So this has to be also bigger than gamma. Sorry for the, for the fuss. So, and the other direction is going to be the same. You're going to perhaps now add minus a plus a minus a prime and the same proof is going to give it. Okay, so, so this shows that the, this topology behaves in a very different way. It is also defined with norms or with valuations, but it's not the usual topology we're used to in the Euclidean, uh, in the Euclidean world. Sorry, what is the note? What position? Any element in a... Any, any, any element in a ball is a center of the ball. Center. So this is usually called the center of this ball mm -hmm. because I am taking everything kind of around a, if you want to think about this way. And here I'm saying, no matter which element I take, it is also a center of the, of the ball. If I take any other element of this ball, it is also a center. So the notion of center, it's not, not very useful in this, in this topology, right? Any element is a center of a ball. I mean, any element of the ball is a center of a ball. Okay. Any question? Yes. Yeah. 
Right. I mean, what is the question? Why are we interested in valued fields at all? Or uh, why we are interested in valued fields by the approach of uh, modern physics? Ah, well, this I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. But you're going to see next week perhaps two things. On the one hand, you're going to have a course on this axe quotient principle, which is a transfer principle, very similar to what we saw from characteristic zero to characteristic P. And in this case, we're going to be able to kind of compare, let, let me say it directly, these two fields, QP and FP, double bracket, double parenthesis T. This is a field of characteristic zero, but this is a field of characteristic P. And as fields, they're very, very different, but when you write elements of each of these fields, they look very much the same thing. In this case, you have formal power series uh, with coefficients in, in P over T, right? And you can write elements in this field almost the same. It's just that addition and multiplication behave differently. They're not defined coordinate-wise as, as in here. Yeah, it's here. Yeah. P is the of T. Exactly. But, but that cannot be the only difference because just playing the role of t, I mean, this is of characteristic zero, this is of characteristic p. The, 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 the operations need to be different, right? So they look like very much each other, but they're very different fields. And the theory that the theorem that you're going to show next week is that when you take an ultra power of all these fields with respect to an unprincipled ultra filter P here, and you take it also here, the corresponding ultra products are going to be elementarily equivalent. So this is a way to transfer properties from that hold for almost every QP to something that is going to hold also for every FPT, even if there are fields of very different nature. So you're going to see a transfer between these two kinds of fields. Okay. This is what you're going to do. Well, you're correct in saying that in the resulting ultra product here, the residue field is going to be pseudo finite. That's, that's true. That's, that's correct. Just the residue field, not, not the whole field, right? So this is the kind of thing that you're going to, to work next week. You're going to think about ultra products of this one and ultra products of this one and notice that the, the ultra products are going to be elementarily equivalent. And in this way, you're going to be able to transfer nice properties you know true for these ones to, to nice properties you don't know about these ones. This is kind of the flavor you're going to have next week. So if you don't know the piadic numbers, <laughs> let me say what I was saying perhaps formally. So any element of QP can be written in this way. Um, I'll tell you this, and then I finish telling you how are we going to treat these objects model theoretically? Like, what is the language we're going to work with these objects in? Okay. Right, any element of QP can be uniquely represented as an infinite sum starting with uh, some integer, right? Starting with integer m. M is an integer. Then you put some coefficients and then powers uh, of P, where AI is just an element between, uh, sorry, right, between zero and P minus one. Okay, you can represent them as, as these infinite sums starting uh, with a given integer. It can be minus two, right? And then you're expressing it as, as somehow of powers of, of P. And the valuation is exactly what you think. The valuation of 
this sum, if if m is really the the starting one, let's say with with a m different than zero, right? You're, you're starting really your series with m different than zero. Then the valuation of, I mean, the piadi valuation because we extend the valuation from q to this new set uh, of numbers. The valuation of such a series is just m. Okay. So they look. That's what uh, you think was was saying. This is. It looks exactly as an element here. I'm just replacing replacing p by t, right? This is exactly how they look like. Of course, addition between these elements and addition between these elements and multiplication is different, right? We need to define them differently. Otherwise, they're going to be just the same the same field. Um, but this here you have coordinate uh, wise addition and and here you add as you add usual usual numbers you just keep track of the of the residue for example if uh, you just need to keep track uh, infinitely right <laughs> i don't know to the well let, let me write you something right for example um, right for example um, let me write this this this, this polynomial um, one plus uh, let's say two t and one plus three t in f five of t, right? This is going to give you just if I add these two polynomials, these two are going to cancel, but this just gives me the polynomial two, right? If I do the same now with the piadic numbers, if I put now this here two p one plus oh well p is now five right i'm thinking of in q five right and i write here this this thing now if i add this to oh, this is in there um uh right i mean i want Here, sorry. I think you want the value to change, no? Oh, oh, oh. One, one plus uh, one, one right. Plus right. Okay. okay. This is one. Exactly. This is five p, but if p is five, then this is p squared, right? And and here I'm not getting a t squared, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So, exactly. So here, my 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 t disappeared, and here really I got a p squared. So the addition is really different in in these two fields, although the representation is very similar, right? And well, what you're going to see next week is that this similarity is just not a, a silly similarity, but that some in to some extent asymptotically these fields. As when when I see them in, in families asymptotically, they're similar in some respect, right? This is what you're going the content of this axe quotient uh, Airshoff theorem that you're going to see next week. This is one 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 possible way. I mean, this is the content of one course. The other course, um, what you will see is a more geometric application of 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 some properties, model theoretic properties, some of these fields are going to have. Um, and this is going to be the content of uh, Imi's, Imi's course uh, on stratifications. Um, right, I, we'll, we'll, we'll see exactly how, how his course goes. Um, something important, let, let me tell you more, a couple of more things, right. I, I, I want to tell you what is the language in, in which we're going to treat these this objects model theoretically. There are several choices. But I'll let you know uh, the more important choices and the ones that you're going to use next week. Um, there are three canonical choices for studying valued fields as L structures for a given language. One is one sorted language. So as we saw just in, in, in 
the whole week just as, as a one sorted structure. And this is the language in which we have the language of rings. And I add a relation symbol of RT1, which I'm going to interpret as the valuation ring. So I'm adding, usually one puts perhaps here this O, right? Okay, let me write P, right? Where where P is a relation symbol of RET1. Okay, and then let me say, if, if KV is a valued field, let, let me call this language, language, one-sorted language, okay? If KV is a valued field, we treat it, it's canonical interpretation, let's say, as an L1 S structure, of course, by interpreting the operations as the field operations. This is just the usual, right? Uh, uh, with its usual. Uh, ring operations, right, or field operations. And we interpret this predicate P, P let's say, in, 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 in this structure. Let we, let we say we treat it as an L, L structure. Let me call this structure curly K, right? So in the, the interpretation of this curly K of my predicate P is just precisely the valuation ring. It's the set of all elements in K for which the valuation is bigger than zero. But note that in this language, I have no, no symbol for the valuation. I, I cannot speak about the valuation. I only have a predicate, a new predicate. But the predicate is interpreted as this subset of K. OK? I have no symbol for the valuation at all. I only have symbol for addition, subtraction, uh, um, multiplication zero one and this new unary predicate that we interpret as the valuation ring. This is one choice. What would be a more natural choice? To add, to add the, exactly, to add the, 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 the valuation. Exactly, ring. yes. What, uh, what is choice that allows you to recover from, from the valuation with first order problem? I'll, 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 I'll let you know that in a second. So you cannot really define you cannot really define the valuation group. The value group, you cannot going to define it with formulas in these languages, in this language. But it is going to be a quotient of a definable set by a definable equivalence relation. So it's, it's not really a definable subset, but it's not too far. It's, you're going to have a definable set and a equivalence definable relation, and the quotient is going to be the value group. But this is because uh, you want to impose that the language is finite for some reason, or no, no, no. You add the, the same sets, but moving the moving the like bx plus uh, greater than one, greater than two, greater than three. So yes, but you have a, but but but, but the, this this. I, I mean, we, we don't know we don't know if the value group is z or or something else, right? It could the value group could be yeah. more difficult, right? So okay. I'll 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 try to I, I'll try to tell you the difference between this languages in a second. Let me give you the second one. Yes. But it, it does have to, I mean, uh, like, it, as long as, maybe as long as we choose P so that it has a unique maximal ideal. It does, right? So for example, it's important that, ah, this is a good observation. Observation, the maximal ideal. I mean, if we start with, with P, not necessarily coming originally from a Right, if, if, so let, let me say, if, if K is a valued field, right? And I treat it as a structure in this language, then the maximal ideal, this maximal ideal of K is actually definable in this language. 
you can show that this is going to be definable. Basically, exactly, very good. So indeed, this is uh, this is defined. It is defined. You can show that. Actually, I, I should have said this, but you can show that in any valued field, uh, the set the set of elements which have sorry the set of elements which have exactly valuation zero. This is precisely the invertible elements of the valuation ring. So now you can say that you are in the predicate, but you're not invertible. And this is precisely the maximal idea, right? So this is defined by the formula, by the L1S formula. Um, P of X and there exists no Y such that Y is also in the valuation ring and X, Y equals one, right? This formula is saying that X is not invertible for elements in the valuation ring and I'm saying I, I am in the valuation ring, right? So this is a formula in one variable. Okay, so you can still in this language speak about the maximal ideal, the valuation ring. You can still say a lot of things about this about this value valued field. Okay. And it's not clear that we can that we can say actually if you give me a an L one S structure, can, can we actually axiomatize being a value field? This, 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 is, this is true, but because valuation rings are completely determined by the, the property that I told you at the beginning. If you have any subring, you can say with, with axioms that P is a subring of K, right? This you can say with axioms, not difficult. You just say it is closed under addition, closed under multiplication. This you can say just with the predicate P. Now you need to say that every X in your field either, well, if it is not zero, it is in P or its inverse is in P. And this characterizes being uh, the valuation ring of some valuation. Okay. So you can really give axioms in this language for the structures which correspond to valued fields. What do you mean? Like, like now we are going to, to uh, suggest to go to a two sort of language. Yes, why? Right? Why? Because, well, why? Because the, the, the value field, already, the value ring, sorry, already, already contains. Sort of information. I, 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 I kind of agree with you. I, you could, you could try to, instead of studying uh, valued fields, study just valued rings or valuation rings. That's a possibility, right? You just write, you just need to write. The only problem is that you need to, how, how are you gonna state that you're a valuation ring? You cannot access the value group that easily, I think, this is because you're the value group comes from the Exactly. Valued group represents you the step, right? Prime ideal, so how do you get prime ideals in this So you cannot really understand the yeah, the problem. The value, the value of the value, value ring by the, by the no, no, the field, the units of the field. By, by the, the units field of the, the. That's correct. He's correct. What? But you, I don't think what it's, exactly. What what Javi is saying? What Javi is saying is that once you have, once you have this set, you already know in a valued field what is the value group because you have that. Uh, this quotient, this is isomorphic to gamma. You can prove that this can be totally ordered by uh, inclusion, right? 
So this is going to be, and the order is going to be compatible with uh, multiplication. So this is going to have the structure of an ordered, totally ordered abelian group. And this is basically the valuation in disguise. So if you already give me just the pair K and a valuation ring, I can construct you exactly what is the valuation of and give you a valued field in the way I presented to you at the very beginning of the, of the lecture. So giving you the data of a field and evaluation ring of, the, of this field is basically the same as giving you K and V. In this respect, you're right. If I only give you O, if I only give you a ring, how would you say that this is the valuation ring of a field? You need to speak about the fraction field of, of this ring. And this is true. If you can somehow speak about the fraction field with formulas, then it is essentially the same saying that always evaluation ring that giving you this. Because when this happens, it is always true that the fraction field of O is K, right? Because of this property of either X or its inverse is an element of O. So this one and this one are very, very close to each other, okay? In, in essence, you're, you're right. So this is why the, the, the choice of the language is, um, is a delicate issue because in essence, you're going to get exactly the same models, right? Any model of this one is going to be a model in any other of the other languages. But having, for example, quantifier elimination in one language might give you something extra that having quantifier in, in, in another language might not give you, okay? So the choice of the language and to prove quantifier elimination in some language might give you extra information depending on the, on the language you choose. This is why we're going to use different languages of, or at least these uh, structures are sometimes looked in one language and sometimes looked in another or studied in another language, okay? Let me give you the other two languages which are perhaps a little bit more canonical choices, right? In, when, when I present you valued fields, um, I present it naturally as, as something having, well, two sorts in a natural way, right? Uh, a sort kind of for the field and something which was totally apart, which is a totally order of billion group. So it is naturally to perhaps study this with a two sorted languages, one for the field and one for the valued group. And this is the language, two sorted language of, two sorted language of, of valued fields. So in this case, you have two sorts Let we call them uh, a sort for uh, the field and a sort, let me put it just gamma, right? The gamma sort, this is just the valued group sort. Perhaps you want to put here value group, doesn't matter, right? Okay. Now for the field sort, I need to put the whole ring language. So I'm going to put uh, addition for the field, multiplication for the field, inverses, additives, inverses for the field, the zero of the, of the field and the one of the field. Okay. For the value group, I need to put addition of the value group the minus of the value group. Since it is a totally ordered group, I want I wanted to have also this order in the value group. This is a binary relation, just comparing two elements of my value group. I want to have the zero of the value group, so the zero of my of my group. And I want something that now links. Ah, I I want a a constant in the value group. This is a new constant. This is a new constant symbol for this little element infinity that I had here. And finally I have, let me call it val, okay? Where val is now a new symbol, which is a function symbol between K and gamma, right? The RIT, if you want the RIT of val is just the sort field goes to the sort value group, okay? And of course, every valued field can be naturally be treated as a 
structure in this language. You just take this sort as the field and take this sort as the value group and make val be the valuation. Right? You interpret val as the valuation. This is the most natural language in which one could study a value group, right? So you can think, you can say things about, uh, for, ex for example, you, you, you can express balls being in the ball of a uh, center at a given gamma uh, for a given element in the, in the valid field. You can express most of the things that we have said. And it's very easy to see that, for example, the, the valuation ring is definable in this language, right? Because now you have really a, an expression to express that you are of valuation bigger than zero or equal than zero, right? So both the valuation ring and the maximal ideal are easily seen to be definable in this language, right? Finally, there is a third language, and this is what is called the three-sorted one, the three-sorted language. And this is, I think, the one you're going to use next week. So in this case, we have three sorts. We have this one, and on top, we have a new sort. So the three-sorted language. Three-sorted language, I think, perhaps, uh, Christian is going to use this L3S for this language. Is uh, you have everything you have in the two-sorted language. So this language, right, together with a new new sort for the residue field. Okay. You also add all the ring languages, all the sorry, the the ring language for the residue field. Zero for the residue field. And the one for the residue field. So all the language of fields restricted to this sort of the residue field. And we also add a new map, which is called res. And this res goes from the field to the residue field. OK? So the arity of res is just going from the sort of the field to this new sort of the residue field. And we interpret it canonically in a valued field as follows. If KV is a valued field with, let's say, maximal ideal, well, with valuation ring O, let me put O of K to know that this is the valuation ring of K and maximal ideal M of K, then we interpret we interpret this new symbol res, right? I, I mean, of course, okay, let, let me put it like this. We interpret the new the new sort as this quotient, right? We I interpret this new sort with the residue field. This is how I'm going to interpret my new sort. Of course, since this is a field, I interpret all these um, symbols with the usual multiplication addition that we have in this field. Uh, and this map the residue right let's say its interpretation let's say we have now this okay the interpretation of m let me put here i want to put interpretation right this is not just a symbol but already the interpretation it's just that i, I didn't give an, a name to the whole structure right I have a valued field, but we're now treating this valued field as an L3S structure, right? Okay. 
this is a function of course that goes from k to sorry to this one and we define it as follows press kv of a given element x if x is really in my in my valuation ring then i take its its quotient modulo m and i take this just x time modulo its maximal ideal and if it is not then i just send it to zero i mean to the zero of of to the zero in my residue field right let me write like this okay so this is a recall that i i need i cannot make this function go just from o k to this quotient because my function has to go from a sort to a sort so i need to define this function totally on, on the sort of the field this is why i need to do this but the idea of this residue map is that it's just the usual uh, quotient map from uh, o of k to the valuation ring to to this quotient and i need to define it what happens outside the valuation ring but i just send anything to to zero Absolutely, I, I could refine an, an actual component. You're going to see this next week. You're going to yet expand these languages with, with some more stuff. And this appears in Khrushchev's This appears in Khrushchev's as well. That's, that's correct. You're going to, you're going to leverage on, on, on this language next week. You need still to add a couple of things. So this is the basic language for the three sorted language for valued fields. And next week, next week you're going to need in, in this language, the, 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 the fields I presented before, the Piadics and the power series of FP. Um, you're not going to see, I mean, this is not, to, not going to be true that they are going to eliminate quantifiers in this language. You need to add more stuff. Uh, but this is the basic start to the languages you're going to use next week. I think there is just one one thing that I, I, I didn't manage to to say to you is what Henselian valued fields are. Henselianity. This is a property which is very important when one studies uh, values field, valued fields. I'll I'll give you one definition, which is not the one that you're going to use next week. So it is perhaps the shortest definition. A valued field KV is Hensilian if the valuation, let's say if V extends in a unique way to every algebraic extension. Of K. So you start with a valued field like this. You have now just an extension of, of fields. Then if this valuation extends uniquely from K to V, this algebraic extension, of course, if it extends uniquely for every possible algebraic extension, then this field is called Henselian. Okay? Now, I think we discussed at some point uh, in this course if it, if it was easy, for example, if you give me a property to know if this is expressible or not in a given language. As I defined it, it seems very unlikely that, that such a property is expressible in the language of valued fields because we're quantifying over all possible algebraic extensions. This doesn't make... a, a the very beginning well how can i express a sentence saying something like this if i, I if i can only quantify over elements in my structure k this is going to be a property which is going to be defined out. well by an infinite number of sentences but it's something that we're going to be able to axiomatize so we're going to be able to axiomatize the class of hensidian fields in any of these three languages okay now you need of course a big theorem of algebra, not big perhaps, but 
another way to characterize Hensilian fields, which is not this one, in order to be able to see that this can be really be expressed by some sentences in one of these languages. And this is basically satisfying Hensel's lemma for polynomials over my field. Try to look up in Wikipedia what Hensel's lemma says, right? And this is something that you will need to express in, in sentences in any of these languages, right? Uh, then next week, what you're going to study a lot is the theory of Hensilian fields of characteristic zero. This is what you're going to be doing uh, a lot next week. So, right, I didn't, I didn't tell it, I didn't say it, but both the piadics and the field FP double parenthesis T are Hensilian. They, they both satisfy this, this condition. In fact, any complete field, valued field is, is Hensilian. Yes? Right, you're, you're using, well, this is one way to prove that Hensilianity is equivalent to Hensel's lemma, because Hensel's lemma is saying that you can lift yeah. solutions over polynomials in the residue field to the to your field, basically. Well, a special solutions, right? You need some conditions on the polynomials, but yes. Yeah. Hensel's lemma, well, I'm, I'm spoiling perhaps parts of what you're going to see next week, but Hensel's lemma says essentially this. If you have a polynomial with coefficients in the valuation ring, and you can prove that when you, when you see this polynomial modular the maximal ideal, so you reduce the coefficients, you give now a polynomial with coefficients in the residue field. If you can find solutions of this polynomial in the residue field, then you can actually find solutions in your starting field, provided this, this solution is a simple solution. So let's say the derivative is not of this solution is not zero. So this is a, a, a powerful tool because it's saying, okay, for example, in, in, in this field, I didn't say it, but I, I should have said this. What, what are the residue fields in these in this two? So in QP and in FPTT, sorry, FP double parenthesis T, what is the residue field here? This is just FP. So the residue field here, um, if this is K, the quotient of OK modulo MK, this is just isomorphic to, to the finite field of P elements. And in this one as well. So for this, for these two. So they actually have exactly the same residue field. And this is very nice if you want to solve polynomial equations, because if you have a polynomial equation over uh, the valuation ring here, then you just need to go and verify if a finite field has a simple solution of this polynomial when you reduce the coefficients, right? And polynomials in finite fields are easier to solve than, of course, in here. So you're reducing the problem of finding solution of polynomial equations when the, all the coefficients are in, in, in the valuation ring to solve polynomials in FP. And the same here. So this is a very nice property of these fields. You, they give you a recipe of how to solve some polynomial equations going, uh, going down into the residue field. Since the residue field is, is easy and very similar to this one. If you go, if you have now polynomials in this field, the residue field of this one is just the complex numbers. So, you know, in the complex numbers, you have a lot of, well, you have plenty of solutions for polynomials, right? Because it is algebraically closed. Then polynomials, which have uh, simple solutions in C are also going to have simple solutions in here. Notice that this is not algebraically closed. This, this is definitely not algebraically close. The, 
T has not a, a square root, for example, right? So it's still, nevertheless, you can find solutions for a lot of polynomials by just going and looking into simple solutions in the residue field. So this field, this field looks very much like algebraically closed. It's not, right? But it, it, it still has solutions for a lot of polynomials. Okay, I think I exceed a little bit my time, but we can finish for, for the week.